control Shoveling dirt in every hole Predators to condemn your soul Watching you and watching me We're all connected but separated Misunderstood and so frustrated A million armies of one have invaded Watching you and watching me To make headlines be immortalized Everyone's got an electric eye with the digital spies Democratized by a lawyer of sessions Watching you and watching me She lives to perfection Don't let them project you as you
Let your experience begin right now. From high atop the mountains of British Columbia to you listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Radio. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride as we are live on Spaced Out Radio. Good evening and welcome to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us as we are broadcasting live on SpacedOutRadio.com and on Spreaker. Once again, we come in from the frozen Canadian tundra, battle our way past the wild animals, sidestep Bigfoot, and enter Uncle Jimbo's cabin, stoke the fire, heat this place up, and broadcast you live this Thursday night, early Friday morning if you're on the East Coast. Here at Spaced Out Radio, we do this thing three hours a night, seven days a week. That's because we want to be your official one-stop shop when it comes to the crypto, supernatural, conspiratorial, ufological, and so much more. Like our music? Head to our website, spacedoutradio.com, where you can hear the guitar god himself, Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses. Check out a couple of his music videos by clicking on the Bumblefoot banner. Also, you can check us out on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. And our website, of course, is spacedoutradio.com. At this time, we we say hello to everyone tuning in in the High Plains Talk Radio Network. In the Spaced Out Radio chat room on Spreaker, along with our fans on Facebook at Euphoria Chronicles, Chronicles of the Unknown, Forest Moon Paranormal, and our flagship chat room, the SOR Space Travelers, that currently has Superlen, a good buddy of mine, Superlen, yes, he wears a cape, sitting in the room ready to chat with you. Hey, Space Travelers, you can now head to Spaced Out Radio's website and sign up for the SOR Space Travelers Club. It's only 5 bucks a month, and with that, your name will be entered into monthly prize draws, have private group interviews, access to a special section on our website, and more. We're going to give you a hell of a lot more than just access to our archives. Also, check out our news feature, the SOR Space Wire, and you can read the latest blogs that have been posted, including mine, about a UFO landing in front of me. April of 2014. Tonight's show is brought to you by Rivulet Reiki and Readings, providing healings in person or to distance. Purpleplates.com, helping heal your body, mind, and soul. The new Agora newspaper is the official paper of this show. And the iTunes app, Spirit Story Box, is the official ghost hunting app of SOR. The forests of British Columbia have something big roaming through the cavernous trees. From the northern reaches near the Yukon to the border with the United States, British Columbia, Canada's third largest province, has had a large share of sightings of the creature the Chehalis Band calls Sasquatch. The creature people are seeing stands on average between 7 and 9 feet tall, weighing between 300 and 500 pounds. The size is intimidating. The roar is freaky. 
The people who are seeing it are fearful and astounded with what they've seen. It's a story most really don't want to talk about with the fear of laughter and ridicule from their peers. Going public with something like that can be devastating to one's reputation. British Columbia has had some of the most amazing sightings ever recorded. From Jacko in Yale being caught in the late 1800s to Albert Ostman in the early 1900s who claimed he was kidnapped by a Bigfoot family before escaping thanks to a can of snuff. Thomas Steenberg has been researching the British Columbia Bigfoot for more than three decades. Sometimes the trail is hot, sometimes it's cold. But he knows the creature is out there, even though it may not want to be discovered just yet. ThomasSteenberg.com is his website. Thomas, thank you so much for coming into Bigfoot land here on Spaced Out Radio. How are you? I'm doing fine, Dave. How are you? I am good, my friend. And you know what? It's good to talk with you again because I used to live in your area of Mission, British Columbia, where you drive 10, 15 kilometers into the mountains, and boom, you're right in Bigfoot territory. This creature just happens to be seen everywhere, doesn't it? In British Columbia, anywhere you go where there's forest country, you're in Sasquatch country. And you know what? Now that I live way up north in the sticks on top of a mountain, sometimes I have to find a Bigfoot cave in order to get some Wi-Fi to tune into the show. But you know what? We make gist of it. But people are seeing something in the mountains here and in their forests and in their local parks. And it just seems that with the way technology is going and the way people always seem to have a camera around, it's amazing that we aren't seeing the creature much more than what we are. Definitely, definitely. That's why it's an ongoing mystery, because the main number one question hasn't changed since all this first started. Does the creature, in fact, exist or not? That is the million-dollar question. So let's get to you. You take more of a scientific research and approach to this, and... There are so many different definitions. I mean, we had Kawani Lapsaritis on a week ago who believes Bigfoot is way more spiritual and, in fact, may not even be there. Now, for a lot of people, and maybe even including yourself, that is far-reaching. But for others, namely a lot of First Nations tribes, they believe that there is something different about this creature, and that's why it stays so elusive. What do you believe Bigfoot is? In my opinion based on 37 years of interviewing eyewitness testimony and investigating, well, in British Columbia, 200 reports now, uh, I think what we're dealing with, and this is assuming that the creature does in fact exist, we are dealing with a large primate, a large ape. That, in my opinion, is the most logical explanation for the Sasquatch, other than its complete mythology. I think the hypothesis of a a large creature in the fossil record known as Gigantopithecus black eye, which according to the hypothesis, probably crossed the land bridge that used to exist between Asia and Alaska around the same time as the ancestors of our First Nations people did. And Sasquatch is simply this species continuing. Do you think then, Thomas, in your 37-plus years of research, that we are any closer than where they were 100 years ago to solving this mystery? Hell no. Because uh, the Sasquatch field, for the most part, not everybody, but for the most part, has gone insane. I like to describe it as a... Asylum that's being taken over by the inmates. You were uh, describing a guest you had a little while ago, the Kawani Jack Lapsaritis. Well, I, I know him, and uh, he's, in my opinion, he's definitely one of the inmates. <laughs> Well, you know what? We're going to get more into the way Bigfoot has taken off. American television has really blown this out of proportion. Now everybody due to these alternative television shows, you're either a ghost hunter, a demon hunter, or a Sasquatch hunter. 
one of the three. And we're going to get into that because I want to talk with you heavily on that, including a conversation I had uh, was lucky enough to have last year with John Bindernagel about this. So what fascinated you, Thomas, about learning this creature? You're a BC boy through and through, I believe. And what brought you to the forest? Why do you have this itch that needs to be scratched about proving the existence of Bigfoot? Okay, if you have to forgive me, I only live 40 feet from the railway tracks and a big freight train is just going by now. You probably heard the, heard the horn. But what first got me interested in this sort of thing was when I was a young lad back in the 1960s. I just had a fascination with two things. One, the wilderness, and two, a mystery. So the two just went hand in hand. I remember my father telling my mother, don't worry, he'll grow out of it, but it never happened. So what happened to me is I just ended up going, moving to Western Alberta when I was posted there with the 1st Battalion PPCLI when I was doing my military service. I took one look at the Rocky Mountains and I said, you know, there's no wall between British Columbia and Western Alberta. If they've been seen in eastern B.C., they've got to be seen here too. So I simply put an ad in in the local press of the southern Alberta region. I simply put an ad, Sasquatch. Anyone who believes they may have had a sighting of this creature, please contact Thomas Stieber, and I had the phone number. And I wasn't expecting much of a result. But my phone was ringing off the hook. It was like I threw a switch. Because no, there hadn't been really anybody looking into reports on the Alberta side of the Rockies then. The first 25 years or so I was involved in this, I was in southwestern Alberta. I finally moved to the lower mainland of British Columbia in September of 2002 because I'd been coming here so much every year, and I wore out two, two engines of my vehicle coming here so often, I thought, well, I might as well, when I hit my 40s, I thought, well, if I'm going to move there, I better do it, or I never will, and I did, and I've been here ever since, doing the same thing, looking into reports of people who have seen something, they can't explain them to themselves what it was, they've told one or two family members about it, they're told they're crazy, so they decided to be quiet about it. Now, you were mentioning in, in the United States with shows like Finding Bigfoot, and believe me, Finding the Bigfoot is probably, this, compared to some, most of the others, it's like a Smithsonian special. Most of them, I, I describe, you could describe it in one term, Duck Dynasty meets Bigfoot. They're ridiculous. And the biggest problem with that is <laughs> it's, it's made seeing a Sasquatch or saying you saw a Sasquatch trendy it's become a cool thing now to say you saw a sasquatch in the united states and that is causing problems well you know what we let's hit it head into that direction right now because i think i agree with you in regards to the television shows you know and like i said it seems like everybody now is either a demonologist, a ghost hunter, or a Bigfoot hunter. And with the television shows really, really going out there, and I'll be honest with you, I don't agree with them. I have actually gone as far as staying away from bringing certain individuals onto this show because I think they make a mockery of it. And mm-hmm. where I got the feeling was when I had a chat with John Bindernagel last year, and, and let's face it, you know, John Bindernagel is a legend in the in Bigfoot research. He's been doing it for almost 70 years, if not past 70 years. He started as a teenager. And, you know, to put it in a sports term, he's like the, the Babe Ruth of Bigfooting. And, you know, I would consider you probably the Bobby Orr if you don't mind me giving that type of reference to you. But, you know, when I saw his defeated face, when I said to him, I said, just the term, I said, tell me what you think of the word squatch. And... Oh, I hate it, but okay. (laughs) And and you know what? You you literally saw, and I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm... you know, trying to make this over emotional or anything like that or over sensationalized, but you literally saw him just kind of take a deep breath and sigh and just, you know, you could see the disappointment that 70 years of research is being ruined by one term squatch. Mm. What do you think about that? Well, John is a professional wildlife biologist. 
He's a Ph.D., and there hasn't been too many of them. There have been some outstanding ones, and he's one of them, that actually put their careers on the line and suffered ridicule from their fellow academics to actually take a serious look at this subject. And John, just like Meldrum and the late Grover Kratz before him, took a lot of heat for their interest in the Sasquatch question. I mean, you know, it's it's like a it's like a club professional academia, and you, you, you can't help but hearing your fellow academics whispering behind your back. Oh, yeah, he's looking at that Sasquatch nonsense. Blah, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and it takes a toll on you when years go by and solid evidence has not been found. I mean, we just recently lost what I could see the grand old man of the Sasquatch question, my, one of my best friends, and he was my mentor, John Green, who passed away last May. It is so sad that he was passed away without an answer, one way or the other, of this ongoing question being found. And I'm 55 now, myself, I don't know how much longer I have. I started looking seriously into this in the 70s, and I'm beginning to think it may not end by the time I die. So someone like John Benenego, who has who is a PhD and takes a lot more heat than someone like I do for their interest in this, I can't imagine what goes through his mind. I just can't imagine it. Oh, that's terrible. When it comes to the television shows, as someone who is out there boots on the ground doing the research, and you look at the television shows, and most people out there, Thomas, you know, they've never been out in the wilderness, let alone how crazy the wilderness of British Columbia can be in certain parts. How much of it is real and how much of it is staged, in your opinion? You mean Sasquatch sightings-wise? Yeah. With, with the advent and the Internet... And all that, 90% of what you see on the Internet is absolute garbage. When it comes to YouTube, I would say it's almost 99%, especially when it comes to alleged videos of Sasquatch. I haven't seen one yet that I've been truly impressed with because I have the attitude, stick to the facts, never deviate the facts. And as far as I'm concerned, any photograph or video image, when the subject in question is open to interpretation as evidence, it is absolutely useless, even if it was a Sasquatch. So, because, go on, oh, please. Yeah. yeah, so, what, what, what does that tell you? you got to find evidence. Too many people who call themselves researchers, you heard me call them asylum inmates running the asylum, there are too many people today who call themselves researchers, but they're more like religious leaders pushing a faith rather than a researcher trying to answer a question. And that is the biggest number one problem with this research today. It's not the witnesses. It's not whether or not they saw something. It is the researchers. It has become a joke. Because people... With the tabloid-type stories and the tabloid-type attitudes, they get the most attention from the tabloid-hungry press because they want to print and talk about the sexy monster stories and rather than talk to someone like me who went out today for a whole day and didn't see a darn thing. You know? But they'll talk to someone who said, Oh, yeah, I saw four Sasquatch. One of them threw a rock at me, and I had to duck no boy, yeah. You know, that kind of thing. They're the ones that will get all the attention, not someone like me who's really seriously looking into matters. Are you running into a lot of other Bigfoot researchers out there in the field now, or is it still pretty sparse? Oh, I, I know, I know uh, all kinds of them, and most of them know me, and quite a few of them don't like me very much. Some of them, it's even got to the point, I know for a fact that some of them no longer tell me things because I don't play ball. I don't, uh, I don't uh, take a shot down the ice with the puck and let it go wherever it may lie. I, I look for answers. And if something is not right or something doesn't sound right or something is fake and I know it's fake, I'm going to say so. 
And a lot of people don't like that. So how many people are you running into on a daily basis in the forests of British Columbia? Oh, well, you mean like just running into people in the bush? Yeah. Very rarely. I think uh, in all the years I've gone out, I've run into other researchers. Never. The only time I've ever had other researchers out in the bush is the ones that have come out with me. There are not a lot of people out there, at least in Canada. In the United States, it's all over the place. Well, more people are going for the television show than they are the actual footage, and we see that a lot in the paranormal f- field as well. Oh, yeah. I've had so many people send me photographs and stuff and saying, hey, could, could you talk to the guys on Finding Bigfoot? Maybe they like me on the show. <laughs> really? I say, oh, yeah. I say, well, I don't know. I don't know if uh, uh, Matt and Cliff and James would be very impressed by this photograph of a stump you sent me. <laughs> Or this blurred picture of a rock. What did you? Reason the other place uh, moved in your second picture is because you shift the camera position, not it, not because it moved. You know that kind of thing. I, I I deal with that all the time. What did you think of those two videos that came out about a year, year and a half ago, on the two Bigfoot sightings in the Stave Lake area of British Columbia? Well, just north of Mission, you mean? Yeah, yes. one. It was shot at Hoover Lake. That was never revealed. I found it. And and I also know the name of the man who was in the video. That was not an attempted hoax. It was a misidentification. It was a long-distance video of a man who was collecting firewood, and if they just hung around for a little while, or maybe they did, and just didn't show this part of the bill, they would have seen him get into a boat and head back across the lake. That's, that, that's what that one was. That was a misidentification. The second one of uh, what appeared to be Japanese tourists snapping pictures of a Sasquatch behaving like a nonchalant black bear in Yellowstone National Park off the side of the road, that was a hoax. I not only know who did it, I know how they got the suit and who they went through to get the suit. Just anybody trying to get that 15 minutes of fame on press, eh? Well, that second attempt was a, group, was a couple who was trying to uh, put on the market a cell phone program called Legend Tracker. It was supposed to be a program where if you could put it on your cell phone, you could punch in a location uh, or where you are, and all the Sasquatch sightings would pop up on a map. And they are doing some, some silly little things to try to promote this Legend Tracker video. Unfortunately, they made a mistake of telling me about it. And they made the mistake of uh, letting me know too much. And they made the mistake of assuming I wouldn't follow up on it. I did. And I found out who they were, what they were doing, where they got the costume, and who they went through to get the costume. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of their biggest mistakes is they took a pretty well-known common costume. This similar suit was used in the mission area for selling cars and real estate and a few funny commercials at the same time. (laughs) I got you there. But on the flip side, it did create a whole world of interest because all of a sudden, the whole world was having their Bigfoot eyes on British Columbia and the mission area. So it did did help with tourism. And despite me publishing my claims and telling everybody what what my results were, there are still people, especially on YouTube, like one guy called Thinker Thunker. Maybe he's changed his mind, but he still thinks that Hoover Lake shows a real Sasquatch. I said, no, it's not. It's a man. He's carrying a backpack, for God's sake. <laughs> if you had way. waited, you would have seen him get into a boat and row off to the other side of the river <laughs> or the other side of the lake. <laughs> but but no, no, no. It's got to be a real Sasquatch. It looks too weird. It's, well, it's got to be a real Sasquatch. And there was another case uh, near uh, uh, somewhere up uh, on the Sunshine Coast around the same time of a distant figure on a on a mountainside on a on a snowy slope, and they thought because of its speed that it could be a Sasquatch. Until one man came forward and said, "I think you filmed me. I'm always out there hiking around up there." But all you see is this small dot way in the distance, and their opinion is moving too fast to be human. But you never say that, because people can move really fast, especially if they're running. 
No, I, and I understand that. But do you think that's because there's the urge that people just want to believe, Thomas? There are people that uh, Sasquatch mystery is no like it's not it's the legend and the mystery. It's just like everything else. Some people are so desperate for anything now that they're willing to believe anything, and they believe the most outrageous claims, and they can't recognize reality even when reality slaps them in the face. That's they feel good. like they've been punched in the gut for a while, and and then they just go quiet on it, and the whole thing slowly dies away. One of our li- uh, listeners is saying you sound a bit like Jimmy Stewart tonight. I'll take that as a compliment. Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Sasquatch. <laughs> exactly. I- I'm loving it. I'm loving it. My friend, we are going to hop out for a break here, so I'm going to get you to hold on. We're going to take a four-minute break here at the bottom of the hour. Thomas Steenberg is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He is one of the prominent and preeminent Bigfoot trackers with almost 40 years of experience in the bush of British Columbia looking for Sasquatch. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back right after this. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members-only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. Hi there. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. SpacedOutRadio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Hey everybody, this is Patrick Webster Small, and I'm here to bring you the Webster Phenomena every Saturday night. Live at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. If you're looking for aliens and extraterrestrials, well, we've got them. Big and tall, short and small. You're bound to find what you're looking for. So join me on the Webster Phenomena right here on Spaced Out Radio. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Have you ever wondered about those weird and strange creatures people have reported throughout history? You wonder if those stories are real? Me too, and that's why I started Cryptopia.us. Hey, this is Rob Morphy, crypto historian. Join me once a month on Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott, where we will get into the odd and bizarre reports from the Dover Demon to Harry Hominids and everything in between. I will break down what people like you and me are seeing at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. Spacedoutradio.com has an advertising tab that you can click on to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with Euphorcop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. 
People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Wachowski's Strange Days. Want to connect with us online? Find us on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show, on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R, on YouTube, Spaced Out Radio Show, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. All right, space travelers, here comes the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio. Welcome back to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, SOR Space Travelers. Your password for tonight is discernment. Bill Cardwell has set the password at discernment, so if you're an SOR Space Traveler, make sure you use it wisely tonight. Tomorrow night on the show, we round out the week talking aliens with resident ET expert, R. Keith Andrews. He is back for his three-hour performance that happens the first Friday of every month, and then we round out the week with Spaced Out Week weekend saturday and sunday if you want to follow us on social media you can do so at spaced out radio on twitter give our facebook page a like spaced out radio show on instagram i can be followed at dave scott sor subscribe to our youtube channel to hear our archives at spaced out radio show and our website is spaced out while there you can click on a number of blogs to read including mine on a ufo landing i saw in april of 2014 you can check out the sor space wire by our news director eric markham and you can sign up for the sor space travelers club it's only five bucks a month with that your name gets entered in a monthly prize draws joe algar was our first winner just last month you get private section for posting on our website and so much more. Unlike the other guys who just give you access to their archives, not us. We're giving back to you. Tonight we're talking Bigfoot in British Columbia. Thomas Steenberg is our guest tonight. ThomasSteenberg.com is his website if you want to check it out. Thomas, welcome back. Hello. I want to get to a couple of questions here. We see a lot of researchers across North America packing armament with them for what they consider safety in case they get bull rushed by a Bigfoot, never mind the cougars, the bears, the wolverines, the elk, the moose that are traveling around the territory. Are you one who carries a weapon with you for safety? Uh, when I'm not in a national park or a game reserve or a provincial park, in other words, somewhere where firearms are prohibited, yes, I quite often carry a 12-gauge shotgun with me. And what's that for? It's mostly for uh, last resort protection from a grizzly attack or a mountain lion attack. But I have to say, in 37 years, I haven't had to use it yet. How close have you come to the danger? In August of 1986, I was charged by a grizzly bear and chased up a bunch of trees. I was actually, I got about seven feet up uh, the trees when it suddenly pulled me down. And for some reason to this day, I still can't explain it let go, and I went right back up the trees. And it was when I got up and I looked down, I realized it was a grizzly bear, not a black bear, because it was rather jack black in color. And he huffed and he puffed and he popped his teeth for about, oh, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes down there before he lumbered off back the way he came. And about an hour after that, I came down out of the tree. And I, and I walked quickly back to my Ford Bronco, which is the type of vehicle I had in 1986, which incidentally is where my shotgun was. And I took my pack off, and that, that's when I realized I was bleeding. And the, the pack I was wearing, which I still keep as a reminder that we are not the top of the food chain, it was absolutely inviscerated. But the only part that got through to my flesh were two small puncture wounds in my lower back, which just required a couple of stitches each. That is the fright, most frightening thing that has happened to me out looking for research in the wildernesses of British Columbia. And you have to be careful because you have to know your surroundings. Like for an amateur like myself, where I have had a Bigfoot encounter, I've explained that one to you, 
in mission. And, you know, somebody like me goes out into the forest who wants to learn this. You know, you have to know your parameters. You have to know where you are, where your vehicle is at all times. You have to know the safety of the forest because, like you said, we're not at the top of the food chain when we're in their territory, are we? No, you have to realize that when you're in wilderness, you are in wilderness. There is a chance you may run into something that may want to eat you. The forests of British Columbia are a beautiful, wondrous place to visit, but it is wilderness, and it's not for the timid. Well, I can tell you this. I've had two cougar sightings in my life in the wild, one in Mission, one... Mm -hmm last winter in my neighbor's yard at around 12, 12, 15 at night, you know, they're a big animal. And when they're hungry, they're, they're just not pleasant to be around. That's right. And we are not the top of the food chain. It is a potentially dangerous place. That's why it's called wilderness. Too many people look at it and they think it's a park. It's not. You have to be alert. At so... All times. You go out on your own, though. Ah, sometimes alone. Sometimes I go out with other uh, researchers who share common interests with me, yes. So why would you go into the forest alone? Because I want to go. I'm, I'm trying to find an answer to this mystery. I've been trying to for 37 years. I'm not going to quit just because I'm by myself. I've spent weeks out there by myself at times. I've been lucky. For people who have never been to British Columbia, and I'm fortunate, I've lived on Vancouver Island, I've lived most of my life in the lower mainland near Vancouver, where you are, and now I live in the central part of the province where literally there's more wild game around here than there are people. How vast of a place is this to hide for Bigfoot or for anything? Go ahead. Well, how fast of a pro- of a place is British Columbia to you for people who do not understand how big British Columbia is? British Columbia just has between 2 and 3 million people in it. 90% of them live within an hour of the American border. There are vast areas out there where rarely do people visit it, let alone trek through. I won't say there's well there are spots and places where probably no human has ever stood. But it is definitely a case there are a lot of places where humans rarely visit. Like you could go out to, uh, to a wilderness area and walk a ridgeline, and you may be the first person who's walked that ridgeline in 75 years. A lot of time in between for a lot of things to live and breed and grow and live out their lives never encountering people. Not impossible in my opinion. British Columbia is vast. Our wilderness areas are bigger and larger. Our unoccupied wilderness are bigger and larger than a lot of European countries. It is big. And it for, is big. And for our American listeners who maybe look on a map and don't realize how big British Columbia is, I mean, if you take British Columbia, you can literally throw California, Washington State, Oregon, Idaho, and part of Nevada in there to make the entire province. That's a big territory. It is a big territory with a lot of a lot of forest. Northern Alberta, same thing. Whole wet, solid trees. The only place you get to the prairies in Alberta is when you leave the Rocky Mountains in the extreme southwest part of the province, and you're in prairie country. Uh, go up north, it is solid boreal forest from side to side. Same thing with Saskatchewan, the same thing with most of Manitoba. And Ontario, they have more square miles of wilderness than British Columbia does. Yeah, but they are also filled with Toronto Maple Leafs fans, so they don't really count. Yeah, well, we, we don't talk about them, all right? We don't. Oh, I, I know we just set off fireworks in the SOR Space Travelers Club because Bill Cardwell is a major Leafs fan, so I'm sure I'm going to get a Toronto Maple Leafs posting here at some point. <laughs> you know, it, 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 you know, it just puts a bad taste in my mouth every time he does that. But anyways, I, uh, you are a believer, though, of Bigfoot. You believe this creature exists. 90% convinced that there is something to the legend. 
I do believe that we are dealing with a creature of flesh and blood, not mythology. 90% convinced of that. I leave out 10% because as a researcher, you have to be willing to accept the possibility that you may in the end turn out to be wrong. That's why I'm a researcher. I'm not an advocate pushing a faith. When you say legend, there's a big difference between legend and reality. What is your discernment between both? Well, legend is where something is well known and many people know about it. The proper word really is mythology. That's where something where a lot of people believe in and many other people don't. And the facts just don't back up the existence of something, thus it becomes into the realm of folklore and mythology. Now, reality is, it's there, it's known, we know about it, and is generally accepted by everybody. The Sasquatch has not reached that point yet. It hasn't reached that point yet for what I like to call the Caucasian researchers, yet there are hundreds of First Nations people who believe that not only is it not just legend, but very real, including in close to your area, the Chehalis tribe, which has had many, many face-to-face contra- uh, face-to-face uh, meetings with the creature on their territory. Oh, yeah. Well, in First Nations lore, matter of fact, the word Sasquatch comes from the Chehalis Reserve of British Columbia. That's where the, where the uh, word was first coined in 1929. And uh, the, the thing, but what I find, my experience with First Nations is, they're really no different than any, anybody else. A large number of them do believe in the existence of the Sasquatch. A certain number of that sum believe in their cultural history of the Sasquatch and, and their oral traditions. And, a, and a, also about a third are no different than anyone else. They say there is no such thing. So is it tough for you to all of a sudden take that opinion, which has been way here longer than the white man ever has, and weigh that into what the legends say compared to what the people themselves are telling you? Well, again, First Nation oral history and legend is just their cultural history based upon the creature itself and what their early beliefs were. It's no different than early Europeans who believed in dragons and things like that. For many, many, many generations, people believed in in stuff like that we now know didn't exist. Now, this one particular one in First Nations, we know a lot of their legends didn't exist. But for some reason, this one refuses to die because people continue to report it. People continue to see it. And most legends and myths don't leave footprints. By the way, just like I told you, Bill Cardwell did post a Toronto Maple Leaf sign in the SOR Space Travelers Club on Facebook. It's making me quite ill right now. <laughs> Tell him, go Habs, go. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> if I would have known that, you know, <laughs> my goodness. I am just surrounded by, by oh. Uh, I'm not even going to get into the hockey talk tonight because we're oh, going to start sorry. debating all over the place. I know 20, 24 rings and counting. I know. You can't hear me because you have the Stanley Cup rings from Montreal in your ears. I get that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm still discussing over last year with the greatest of uh, franchise starts followed by the greatest Titanic nosedive in franchise history. I was pretty disgusted with them last year. So. I hear you. I hear you. And then you got the big trade this summer between You're Ottawa right. and Nashua. You know, yeah, so. they, they could use the Sasquatch on the line, I think. Absolutely. Michael in the SOR Space Travelers Club would like to know how many Bigfoot have you ever encountered? In all the years I have searched. Well, what did he mean by account? Like sighting one myself? Yeah. In all the years I have looked, 
I may have caught a fleeting glimpse myself only once. I believe we went, I went over this the last time I was on your show. That was in 2004. I was taking a fellow named John, who is a uh, the watchman at the camp up at 20 Mile Bay on the west side of Harrison Lake. And just before you get to the air where the turnoff is to go down to 20 Mile, there's a there's a, a large valley. Mm-hmm. That, the entrance to Mystery Valley. Now, I was we were on the one side driving down the road in my Land Rover, looking down the cut line where the, lot, where the big, large steel power lines are, because they go back for miles. And over the crest on the other side of the valley, about a mile distance, I saw a figure walk from the middle of that cut line and disappear in the trees on the right-hand side. He was jet black in color. He was walking upright, but he was too far away to see any fine detail. And as I, to, uh, as I told you before, my philosophy has always been from the beginning to stick to the facts and never deviate the facts. The facts are I saw a figure. The facts are it was jet black, head to foot. And the facts are it appeared to be walking upright. But if it was a large man up there, I can't figure out how many Wheaties this guy was eating. If that was a Sasquatch, I have seen one. If it was not a Sasquatch, I still have not. Well, knowing the territory, I think it's more in favor that you did. I know exactly where you're talking about because I have ATV'd in that area. I've been down to 20 Mile Bay. It is as remote as you are going to get being so close to civilization. That's for sure. And that area, I mean, you just never know, you know, but on the flip side, you've also encountered a lot of footprints. Oh, yes. So why haven't the footprints convinced you that this creature fully exists 100%? Because there's always a chance I may be wrong. The footprints, more than anything, is the reason I'm up at 90% and haven't given up on this whole thing. As a matter of fact, if it weren't for a certain track finding in 1986, I might have given up on the Sasquatch and done what my ex-wife wanted me to do, concentrate on other more important things. You mean, there, you mean there's more important things than Bigfoot? Not as far as I'm concerned. By the way, use the Canadian term, Sasquatch. Amer- Bigfoot's the American name. Well, we, you know what, the reason why I say Bigfoot quite a bit is literally 80% of our audience is in the United States, so I have to play both sides of the border here. Nah, they use Bigfoot all the time, they don't bother with Sasquatch, we use Sasquatch, they can switch to our way. <laughs> wow, okay. All right, well, being Canadian then, I will say Sasquatch. How many prints have you casted over your time? Oh, uh, I've cast footprints on, oh, at least five occasions. I have seen alleged tracks probably eight times, the most recent in uh, June this year by Rewa Creek. Uh, I'm convinced that I don't think someone was walking around with their bare feet unless they've got the largest, grossest feet you can possibly imagine. But there are certain things about tracks that lead me to believe that, that they're probably authentic. That is, assuming the creature does exist. Things like toe movement. Things like compression lines compared to impact ridges. Things like mid-tarsal break. Variants from track to track to track. Things like that convince me that if, most likely, if the Sasquatch does indeed exist, these tracks were made by one. If the Sasquatch doesn't exist, it never did, well then, none of them were made by one. As someone who has seen Bigfoot, and seen, and I was literally on the, swearing on, the children, on my children's lives, I know that's a bad thing to do, I was probably within 85 feet of the one and 100 feet of the other. Seeing the size of them up close and personal, they are massive. Why don't you tell me about that? You mentioned it the last time we talked, but you never told me any details. Okay, I'll get into it. I have no problem doing that. In the backwoods of Mission, where I used to live, and 
believe it or not, this is the first time I actually saying that I lived in Mission, British Columbia before moving up north. Friends of ours lived on a, uh, there's a golf course, a nine-hole golf course. And then if you continue up the hill, there's a bunch of acreages up there that leads to another, and the road leads to another golf course. Well, off of one of the side streets, they lived on a street where they had 10 acres, their neighbor had six and a half. And horseshoeing both properties was a forest. Now, this is a forest that is not tracked by a lot of people. There's no hikers, there's no mountain bikers, there's no motorcyclists or ATVers. This is private crown land. And you know, because there's a lot of creatures and it's kind of the extension into, well, let's go up into the Stave Lake area, which is a giant lake here in the lower mainland that feeds into the Fraser River. You know exactly where I'm talking about, Thomas, in that area, right? Right above the dam, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but it wasn't that high. This was more civilized on uh, on the mountain. I don't even know what the mountain is called. You know, uh, the street was called, I believe, Tyler or something like that. Anyways, so we are, the friend who owned the property, and that property had been in his family for about 41 years at that time, he wanted to show me a paranormal experience that happened to him and his buddy while they were playing in the forest. And this would have been probably 30 years ago, because I think he was like 9 or 10 when this happened, and he's 44 now. So we get about... I'm going to say 400 yards into the forest. And we come across this tree that is freshly snapped at about eight feet high. And me having, being an enthusiast of Bigfoot and always wanted to see one, this would have been in September of 2013. And you, you, we're looking around this tree and I said, well, you know, Bigfoot or Sasquatch has the ability to... Um, take down trees as a signal or a marking that they do and uh, okay hold it there for a second yeah that has never been established i have no doubt they are capable of snapping or twisting trees but that right. was never established as a fact True. that's a that's a that's what another one of these things that have been told over the years where it has taken on a life of its own, and it really never should have. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I'm saying well, I have no direct evidence to suggest that it is definitely a, a sign of Sasquatch activity. I have talked to hundreds of witnesses who said they've seen Sasquatch. I have talked to hundreds of witnesses who claim to have found things like twisted trees, but I'm yet to talk to anyone who claimed to have watched a Sasquatch twist a tree. I've never fact, seen that, it either. That... that, that a uh, broken tree theory was put first put forward by the late Bob Titmus, who was a friend of mine, in the early 1960s, and it was an hypothesis that maybe Sasquatch had something to do with it. And through years of retelling and stories and stuff yes. like that, it took on a life of its own. And most people coming into this field nowadays almost accept it as gospel when it's never really been truly established. Oh, true enough. But, you know, I'm going off of very amateur, uh, you know, research that i did i'm not going to say right. so, i'm not going to say the word science because i hate it when people throw the word okay. science in but let me ask you directly did you see what broke off that tree not at all not at all okay okay <laughs> what we did know is that it was fresh the bark was still right. wet it was very very fresh and then you know when you get that feeling in the wilderness that you're being watched yeah. and and my friend and i got that feeling and we started looking around, and about 100 feet in front of us, there was this tree. And it was kind of in the shadows from the way the sun was shining through. And there was this face peering out from behind the tree. And then it would pull back in, and then it would come out, and we would see the shoulder. We could see the right arm. And then it would pull its face back where we could only see the shoulder. And this went on for about five minutes. And him and I are looking at this. And... It got to the point where your eyes finally adjust and you could see the face. You could make out the face. So we knew we weren't looking at a person playing games. We knew we weren't looking at, like, this was big. It, we knew it wasn't a bear, okay. right? 
we've done i that's one thing i have done enough in the wilderness is to know what's a bear and what's not a bear okay any, just any, to clarify for your audience yes it was peeping out from behind the broken tree it was peeping no. out from behind the one yeah about about 100 okay. feet about 100 feet north from us so very okay. very close okay so after about 5 minutes you know, not even thinking that I had my iPhone in my pocket, and let alone everybody knows the iPhone takes such wondrous pictures, so, you know, there would have been no purpose in even trying to snap a picture. We just decided to leave. Mm-hmm. And, and I started turning to my right, and as I'm turning to my right, I'm still looking, I, all of a sudden, my eye, out of the corner of my eye, I see something that stops me, and that is this tree branch that is shaking vigorously, almost like you would try and shake cherries off a branch or apples off a branch or something along those lines, like just shaking really vigorously. And it caught my attention. I stopped, and that's where I got the full right right profile of the second one, which I I, I saw from the waist up. It was brownish red in color. It had no neck. It went straight shoulders to the pointed head and then the slanted face down. And that thing walked right through where that branch was shaking. And within a second of walking through where that branch was shaking, it was gone. I didn't see it again. And I said, I'm out of here. Okay, now how do you conclude that it was the second one and not the same one you saw before? The timing to move from, say, at 12 o'clock at 100 feet to about 1.30 on the clock at 85 feet, we would have heard it. There would have been... Uh, there would have been... There, were, there would have been... The many th- witnesses have said is how fast these things can move, how quiet they can move, and how they can almost disappear. Not like virtually disappear, but like just slip away unseen. Very true. Very true. Yeah, now, was it a different color than the one that you saw yes. keeping up from behind a tree or anything like that? Or, or, or are you are you just assuming it's a second one and it's not the, the first one trying to maneuver you away? Well, you know what? We're at a break here. We're going to continue this conversation right after we get back. Sasquatch Talk on Spaced Out Radio tonight, investigator Thomas Steenberg is our guest. ThomasSteenberg.com is his website. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll pick up that story right after we get back. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. We'll give you some equipment updates and some of our experiences on the road. Right here on Spaced Out Radio on the Spreaker.com network. Oh, there's only one way to rock. Loud and proud. In high definition. Radio 702 Rocks. Las Vegas. Do you believe you've been in contact with extraterrestrials? Have you seen the greys, the mantis, or the reptilians? I am Samantha Mullet, and on the second Tuesday of each month, you can listen and learn from my experiences with off-worlders on Spaced Out Radio's the ET Experience. With host Dave Scott, we'll sit down and chat about what's going on with our friends from other worlds. We'll also try to answer your questions. So please, tune in on the second Tuesday of the month, only on Spaced Out Radio. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us. From radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. 
every Saturday and Sunday night starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com, where I, Vincent Zunza, and my super sleuth partner, Alexandra Sullivan, track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest, from Bigfoot to Mel's Hole, and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? right here at spacedoutradio.com. Attention Spaced Out Radio listeners. For only $5 a month, you can join Spaced Out Radio Space Travelers. Your membership at spacedoutradio.com will give you access to private fan area on the website, get you a monthly newsletter, draws for monthly swag, and a whole lot more. Sign up today to become a part of the Spaced Out Radio experience. Right here, this is where we divulge the fruit of our research. Here on the Webster Phenomena every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern on Space Out Radio. And we give it up to you guys, all the listeners and the live listeners. You can get something special and then hang out in the chat room. And uh, we love to have you. So we'll see you every Saturday night at 8 p.m. You know where. If you're a fan of social media, you can follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can also follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Our YouTube channel, where our archives are stored, is Spaced Out Radio Show. And of course, our website is spaceoutradio.com. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Tomorrow night, we round out the week with some ET chatter from a resident extraterrestrial expert, R. Keith Andrews. He's back for his monthly show, which happens the first Friday of every month, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time. Reminder to you that you can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott S O R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. While you're there, let's see if I don't get tongue tied. While you're on our website, you can read up on our latest blogs, including mine on a UFO encounter that I had in 2014. You can also read up on the S O R Space Wire by our news director eric markham check out our music master bumblefoot by clicking on his banner and while you're there take the time to join the sor space travelers club works out to five bucks a month you get access to a private section on their website your name gets put into monthly prize draws and so much more unlike the other guys we give you a heck of a lot more than just access to our archives bill cardwell the toronto maple leafs fan has set the sor space travelers password for tonight it is discernment discernment is your password space travelers use it wisely tonight we are talking bigfoot of british columbia our researcher is thomas steenberg his website thomassteenberg.com welcome back good to be here now right before the break you asked me did i think it was one or two bigfoot that i saw i am convinced that there is two because we had the guy 100 feet away at about noon on a clock, at 12 o'clock on a clock. Then at about 1.30, 1, 1, we had the second one walk through where the tree branch was shaking. I am still convinced that there was a third one there, because something had to be shaking that tree branch where Sasquatch number two walked right through. And... Did you observe the branch shaking at the same time you saw the one from the waist up? The branch I saw shaking before I saw number two walk through. Okay. Now, how close was number two to the branch? I'm going to say five feet, six feet. Okay, but you never saw what was actually shaking the branch? No. That is the that is my the mystery that I cannot solve. Because it was like, you, like I said, if you're near a, a very full cherry tree or 
a, a nut tree and you want to shake off whatever is there. Like it was up and down, up and down as fast as you could shake that. That's what has led me to believe that there was actually a third Sasquatch there. Because I don't think it was some somebody out there just shaking a tree branch and then all of a sudden Bigfoot walks through. You know what I'm saying? I don't see that at all. Now, before we go on, let's just establish some things here. What time of year was this? Uh, it was around September 10th, 2013. Late summer. Okay. Was it at night or day? Around 4 o'clock. In the afternoon? Yes. What were the conditions? Was it a sunny day? Was it a cloudy day? Was it raining? Beautiful sunny day, no clouds in the sky. Was it old growth forest or second growth forest? Old growth. Excellent. So nice big trees. Yes, sir. Uh, were there a lot of shadow effect in there? Only around the big trees. Yes, there was. Because at that oh. time of the day, the way the sun was coming in. So there was shadow effect. I generally know the area you're talking about, and there is uncut old growth forest in that area. It's a beautiful area, by the way. Yes. And uh, when, when you had a second witness with you who also saw these things. He only saw the first one. He had already turned his back to walk down the second trail, and I was on my in the way of turning left to right in order to go back down the trail to walk out. Because I asked him, I said, did you just see the second one? And he's like... Damn it, no, I missed it. Okay. Now, did anyone else know that you two were going to be there at that time? Just our wives. Your wives wouldn't go out to do the things to scare you in ghillie suits or anything like that? <laughs> no, there's uh, young children involved, so they weren't leaving the house. Okay, that's good. Now, did you check for footprints around the area at a later time or a later date? Did you go back? You know what? I went back to the Broken Tree twice since then. Uh, friends of mine whose property that was in front of this forest, they're very spiritual people, and mm-hmm. and they really, really they are big believers in Sasquatch. They really didn't want to disturb it. They wanted it oh. to have it their area. Okay, now I understand that. And we won't identify them. We'll keep them private. Yes. But no footprints. You never, you never saw any footprints. You didn't stick around to look for footprints. No, we did not stick around. Because when you see something that big trekking through the forest at that close, you realize that, like you said, you know, there is, you're not the top of the food chain. Right. You feel rather insignificant at the moment, right? Well, you know that that thing could break you in half. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, and and trust me, I don't want to say that I was fearing the creature. I was very amazed and thankful for the sighting that I had. But on the flip side, I'll tell you something else that happened. A few months, a few months later, I took some people back there, okay, who wanted to see the broken tree because they had heard the story. And the wind was blowing, and all the trees were blowing eastward because there was a strong westward wind or eastbound wind coming through. Okay, And when we looked off into the distance, there was one tree right in the middle of all these trees that were swaying to the right, and this one was swaying back and forth, left to right, left to right, like almost in an, in an angry way. Like It was almost, Thomas, the feeling that I got from it was, we know you're there. We see you. Please leave. That's it. Yeah, but, but you never saw what was moving the tree. No, no, but... I mean, strange effects have it. I've seen trees all move one way and another one was because the wind gets reflected or deflected by either ground features or whatever. There could be other explanations for that, or it could be a Sasquatch doing it. You just don't know because... You, you don't know. It. You don't know because you saw it, but if, if you go by the gut instinct... Okay, because mm-hmm. here's the other thing that happened, and this is where I question my belief on Sasquatch that I'm not sure what this is. There was a lot of paranormal activity on this property, and we actually had a First Nation shaman who's a friend come in, read the property, and was able to determine that 
long ago, like we're talking 120, 130 years ago, that this area was a, a, you know, almost like a stopping ground for a First Nations family or tribe or a small tribe, right? And anyways, lots of paranormal activity on the property. And we were doing a, a walk around the property just to try and feel it out. And when we started walking from behind the house to the front of the house, there's this old cherry tree that's probably 60, 70 feet away from the house. Old, you know how cherry trees turn black as they get older. And I'll tell you this, and once again, God is my witness. Two of the, I, we had the feeling, all four of us had the feeling that we were being followed. And we walked about halfway down the length of the house. We turn and look. And two out of the four of us, and I'm one of the ones who's included in this, actually saw by the cherry tree from the ground until about eight to ten feet high, there was almost a pixelation of, you know, when you pixelate someone's face on television because you want to hide their identity or computer pixelation or something along those lines. And it was wide and it was tall, like eight to ten feet high. And only two of us, me included, in the sighting could see that pixelation. The other two did not. So after about 20, 30 seconds, we continued walking to the front of the house. And when we got to the front of the house, right behind us from the forest, that's when we heard the roar. And the roar went on for about four or five seconds. And it was the eeriest, scariest, put all the hair up on your neck, standing noise that I have ever heard. I've heard bears. I've heard cougars. I've heard the wildlife from our area. Nothing sounded like this. Mm -hmm. All right, that's that's interesting, but to me it's a digression from the main subject, which is what you saw and what they were. Oh, true enough. True enough. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, Kalani, I mean, what uh, Kalani, the guest you had a week or so ago, would have jumped on that and said, "Well, that's proof they're interdimensional shapeshifters," and la 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 stuff like that. To me. To me, that is irrelevant. I'm more interested in what you saw, and was there any evidence to back up what you saw? Now, I understand you were carrying a camera at the time. Well, I had my iPhone, I, and you know what? I'll be honest with you. I didn't even think of that it was in my pocket. Didn't even think I about it. I, I can understand that. That's a perfectly reasonable human reaction. Shame on you for reacting that way, Dave, but it's perfectly I, understandable. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you give me hell for that. Yeah, no, I can't because I didn't get pictures of the thing I saw in 2004. It was over in five seconds. I, could, I didn't have time to bring my Land Rover to all. And the camera was sitting right there beside me on the seat. I didn't get a picture of it, so I can't blame you for not getting a picture of it. It's well, just shame on you pity. then. Shame on you then. <laughs> it's just a pity we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. Right. But in your case, if it's possible you saw one, and maybe there was two there, I don't think that's been established 100%, but assuming that you saw what you believe you saw, there was at least one Sasquatch there, possibly two. Now, what I would have done if I had been called to investigate, I would have searched the area where these things were and where they had been to see if there were anything like footprints around. Well, you know what? Uh, that's that's one of those kick, kick myself in the hair. butt to do that, right? Uh, or whether there was hair stuck and tufts of hair stuck to that branch. Oh, absolutely. Like absolutely. To back it up. That's, that's what's important. Because... Even though it is absolutely 100% real to you, assuming the Sasquatch does exist, and assuming you saw one, possibly two, the problem is you're just another guy who says he saw a Sasquatch because there was no backup evidence whatsoever. Absolutely. Because no follow-up yeah, no follow investigation was done. Thus, the mystery continues. And I am part of the problem because of that. Let's get to some questions from our audience because they are building up right now. Let's go to Kat's Roger question. That. Kat's question in the Spaced Out Radio chat room on Spreaker. She is asking, 
let's say for a minute Bigfoot does not exist. What do you, Mr. Steenberg, think is creating these footprints? If there is no Sasquatch, and there never was a Sasquatch, that means all tracks are either misidentification of human or animal tracks or their deliberate hoax attempts. Do you think there's a lot That's of ho- Do you think there's a lot of hoaxers out there that are going out there with these fake footprints and making trails? So much, not so much here. There are some. There are individuals, like there's a certain individual who calls himself a researcher in the Maple Ridge region who goes up to Golden Ears Park all the time, who I personally caught hoaxing in 2009, and he's definitely one of the lunatic fringe. I wouldn't put anything past an individual like that. But in the United States, it has reached epidemic proportions. And who's telling you that? The evidence points to it. Investigation leads to an explanation. There was one set of tracks found, oh, I can't remember the name of the lake. It was just a few years ago. There was over 100 prints there. And through investigation, a fellow researcher concluded, found out who did it and why he did it. Let's go to Michael's question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. 112 footprints I found in 1986 along the Chilliwack River, to me, I still think they're probably authentic, assuming the Sasquatch that the couple fishing saw was real, and they saw what they said they saw, and I found the tracks. The witnesses never did. But there were two guys in the same campground further down that were snickering and chuckling the whole time, and part of me still wonders, did they pull something off? To try to pull the wool over over our eyes? That's a possibility. One of the best cases I ever looked into was Waterton Lakes National Park, where four witnesses saw a Sasquatch and actually went driving around looking for it. I ran into a, three people in a pickup truck who said they saw something too and they were looking for it. But these three people never identified themselves, never went to the park warden's office like our four main witnesses did, and I've always wondered, did these three people pull off a hoax and we're hanging around to see if their theatrics were successful? I don't know, but it's a possibility. Because if there is no Sasquatch and never was a Sasquatch, then everything, everything that's ever been reported is either mistaken identity or they're hoaxes. There's no other explanation. Michael has a question in the SOR Space Travelers Club on Facebook. He is asking, besides footprints, have you found any other trace evidence? Hair samples, scat? Uh, scat is rather useless because even DNA analysis on scat, you're most likely going to get a reading from whatever the thing ate rather than what it, well, from what it came from. Hair samples, there have been interesting results with some hair samples found. I have a few here myself. Uh, there have been, uh, just to give you, this was the late 90s, Lowenstein examined two samples of hair, alleged Sasquatch hair, that were sent in, and he had developed a immune reaction to protein levels of DNA in hair samples. Unfortunately, the method in those days, he had to grind up the samples to get the results. And he came up, it's got some positive reaction to human, and it has possible reaction the chimpanzee. He says, so we either got a man out here with very odd problems, or we've got a chimpanzee running loose with very odd problems, or we've got something new and unclassified that's rather similar to both. Now that was interesting. Now the problem with DNA is we don't have a Sasquatch to compare it to, so the best they can tell you is it's higher primate and it's unidentifiable. But it would be great to keep that on record in case a, a truck plows the Sasquatch on the Trans-Canada Highway tomorrow, and then we'll finally have something to compare it to. So do you believe in the idea of sending a team of qualified hunters into the forest to try and hunt and kill one just for the DNA evidence and the fact that we can actually prove the existence? No, uh, I, I like the idea, but it's never going to happen because uh, no official i.e. science government, is ever going to lift a finger to prove the existence of the Sasquatch as long as it remains in the realm of mythology in their eyes. Well, at least we have a law in British Columbia that it is illegal to kill one. Coming with a fine? Yes, there is. 
Columbia. There's only one place in North America where there's a, there's a fine for killing a Sasquatch, and that's Camania County in Washington. And that was more to stop people from going around in guns rather than anything else. And it was a uh, $10,000 fine, but it was a city ordinance, Stevens, Washington to be exact, and they, they, they reduced it to $1,000 because they found out they didn't have the legal authority to, to set such a heavy fine, nor could they send somebody to jail for five years. But it's, it's there, and it's on the books in Skamania County in Washington. And that is the only place I'm aware of everywhere in North America where the Sasquatch is officially protected by law. And, what, and the reason that law came about was there was a famous sighting right along the, the main highway going into Stevenson by a man who was driving in the early hours of the morning who saw this thing cross in front of his car. He went into a local coffee shop to talk about it. A couple of local reporters were there and overheard the conversation. It was front page news, and they had a bunch of guys running around with guns, gunshots were firing off all over the place. No one ever hit anything or anybody, fortunately. And that's why this town, the town commissioners brought out their Skamania Bigfoot Ordinance, which was put into effect April 1st, April Fool's Day, 1969. I swear I did see it, because I've read the law on this show. Okay, I, 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 if you... Point out to me where the Sasquatch is protected anywhere in British Columbia. I'd love to hear it because I am not aware of that. Well, I I'm trying to Google it here because I have read the law, and I'm mm-hmm. looking. And I'm by the way, as I'm looking here, I am looking at the video of the man with the backpack in the far distance. So yes, that does look like a backpack on his back. Mm-hmm. I'll give yeah. you that. I'll give you that one. Yeah. Michael is also well, not only. Not only does he have a backpack, I know his name. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. Get me, get me an autograph. Get me an autograph because he's famous now. <laughs> oh, yeah, he is. And he, he chuckles about this every time he, he sees himself on YouTube. Another question from Michael here, and he is asking, what size of footprints have you found? The best set of footprints ever found was all those footprints in, uh, along uh, the uh, Bald Beard Creek, which flows in the Chilliwack River in August of 1986. They were 18 inches in length on average. Have you found them in all random sizes? Because I know when I met with John Bindernagel last year at a conference in Surrey, British Columbia, he actually had samples of his casting. I think the biggest one he had was like 19, 20 inches, and the smallest one he had was about 8, 9 inches long. It almost seemed like a child Bigfoot. Uh, the most interesting one he, he found was a, uh, set along a hiking trail, I think it was Strathcona Park, and somebody, a hiker, had come along and actually stepped in one, so you got this guy's sneaker print right in the middle of the Sasquatch track. <laughs> he stepped in it without realizing it and almost ruined it. But John was able to go there and photograph it and take a casting of it before it got destroyed any further. What do you think of Bigfoot knocks? That question comes from Eric in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Again, that's another one of these things that's taken on a life of its own. I don't put any credits to it. Not much. It's not impossible, but it's, it's, it's an easy thing to fake. There are people banging trees out there all the time. People call blasting sounds and getting answers, but first thing they ought to do is find out if there's any other researchers within two miles in the same area and then make sure they're not call blasting back and forth. Uh, I've heard knocks and strange knocks. I've heard uh, all kinds of sounds. What I have not seen is any evidence that Sasquatch is responsible for it. I mean, the way I look at the wood knocks, and I think if there's any evidence out there that I wouldn't trust it would be the wood knocks because unless you know you're in an absolute remote area where there is no hikers, bikers, ATVers, outdoor enthusiasts hanging around, or campers especially, you don't know if somebody hears that echo thinking that you're the Sasquatch and they're just responding back to you. Well, again, you can never say you may believe there's nobody around, but you can't prove it. Oh, there's exactly. always a Comes around. I remember going out with a radio crew up Chehalis Lake 
uh, a show called uh, Subcultures that were doing a documentary radio show on the Sasquatch, and we were listening to Knox in an area where there wasn't supposed to be anybody. So we started following, getting closer and closer. We could hear him. Then all of a sudden we heard him drop the tent poles. Cling. <laughs> and we knew there were people down there. But there wasn't. There usually wasn't. Not everyone sticks to a campground. So there are a lot of guys out there who are a little bit more hardcore that like to go into remote areas and camp like I do. And sometimes they're whacking things or they're chopping things and they're making noise, they're throwing rocks against other rocks, they're doing, they're going about their own business, and some naive Sasquatch hunter, uh, less than a kilometer away, hears it and thinks, oh, there's Sasquatch making noise. I mean, a noise in the woods is just that, a noise in the woods, unless you saw what did it. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Agreed. That's the same thing with anything. A noise in the dark, a noise in the woods is just that. Unless you saw what did it, you've got nothing. It's just a noise. There could be other explanations. And on that note, we are about 30 seconds before we have to take a break. Do you consider yourself more skeptical about everything, like a five senses type of guy, or do you leave open the possibility, Thomas? I, as I said before earlier, I am 90% convinced that the Sasquatch is real, it is a creature of flesh and blood, and there are probably a fair number, but not a great number of them, in the wilderness areas of British Columbia. And on that note, we are going to hop out for a break here at the bottom of the hour. We have a half an hour left with Thomas Steenberg tonight as we talk Bigfoot. Eric Markham from the SOR Space Wire will join me for hour number three. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back right after this. Have you ever had an extraterrestrial experience? One you just couldn't explain? Well, maybe I can help. Hello, I am Samantha Mullet. On the second Tuesday of each month, I will join Dave Scott on Space Out Radio to bring a human aspect to ET contact. It's something I've lived with my entire life, and I'd love to help you understand. Let's share our experiences. The ET experience, the second Tuesday of each month, only on Space Out Radio. Fairies? Bigfoot? Dogmen? Trolls? Goblins? Hey, if it's cryptid in any way, I'm looking into it. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, also known as Spaced Out Radio's Crypto Guru. Join me every second Wednesday of the month on Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott, where we will talk about the stories people call tall tales. I will fill you in on the latest sightings and the hidden histories that are causing quite a stir. You can find everything at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Jolene with Reveal at Reiki and Readings, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr, or my Facebook page, rivuletrnr, to set up an appointment for relaxation, Reiki, or readings, no matter where you are. It's time for you to make time for you. Would you like to expand your clientele? Have you ever thought of online radio advertising? Check out spacedoutradio.com to get your name out there. Our listeners support those who advertise with us, so why not give it a try? We have the most competitive advertising prices out there. Just click on the advertising tab on spacedoutradio.com and contact us today. Are you an ET experiencer, but you just don't know what's going on? Are you too timid or shy to discuss it with anyone? Maybe I can help. Join me, R. Keith Andrews, the first Friday of every month on Spaced Out Radio, and I will help you to find the answers you're looking for. Together, I will help you understand the off-worlders and the true meanings behind your experiences. All you have to do is join us in the Spaced Out Radio chat room. See you there. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. 
Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. SpacedOutRadio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up. Enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Hi there. This is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large. Heard only on Space Out Weekend at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. Do you have a topic or a guest that you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Let us know at spacedoutradio.com where you can sign up to become a Space Traveler member today. Or you can find us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. We're talking Bigfoot with Thomas Steenberg tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Is a creature real? Does it exist? Is it an anomaly? Who knows? We'll find out more in the next half an hour as Thomas will be with us for the next 30 minutes. Reminder, tomorrow night on the show, our Keith Andrews is here. The ET Experience, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. If you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. While there, you can sign up for the S-O-R Space Travelers Club. It only equals out to about five bucks a month. You get your name put into prize draws, you get special access to the website, and so much more. You can read the S-O-R Space Wire by our news director, Eric Markham, who will be joining me at the top of the hour for an hour number three, and so much more. Everything at spacedoutradio.com. Now we bring in Thomas Steenberg, Bigfoot researcher the last 40 years. Thomas's website is thomassteenberg.com. Welcome back. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. Now we're in a race for time here because your phone is dying. You're down to one bar. <laughs> so it usually lasts. Two hours, but not much longer than that. Well, you know what? I uh, I want to get that through to our audience. So if all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you're not there, well, then we know why you're not there. It's because technology has failed us. Damn it! You know, but that's the way we'll play it out. Roger. <laughs> Question from Cat in the spaced out radio chat room on Spreaker: What do you think about the so-called talking people witnesses say they have heard in the forests? nothing to do with Sasquatch, so I have no interest in it. You stay away from all of those type of theories. That's right. As far as I'm concerned, they're just part of the asylum of the uh, the image running the asylum. I have no interest in that stuff whatsoever. If you believe in Bigfoot, Joe wants to know, do you also believe in extraterrestrials? Yes, but again, that has nothing to do with Sasquatch. It is not my field. However, I do, I'm not naive enough to think that Earth is the only little ball in all of space that has life on it. Whether that life is coming here, well, that's a mystery just like the Sasquatch, isn't it? Did you ever have any experiences during your time in the military? With UFOs? No. I remember one time as a child being on a trip with my cousins and my uncles when we saw a glowing object come down into the trees near King Kirkland, Ontario. Don't know what it was to this day. Was it a weird atmospheric effect? Was it something else? Don't know. That's the, the be- best experience I have had of something that could possibly be a UFO. But I was only about 10 or 11 years old at the time, so this would be the mid-1960s. I want to introduce our audience to the story of Jacko. 
Your name I, is on there, written on the foreword on a book by Christopher L. Murphy and Barry Blount, who we've apparently recently lost in 2016. So I would love for you to tell the story, though, because I think this is one of those hidden Sasquatch stories that just has fallen by the wayside. Tell us about Jacko. The Jocko story is what is one of what we call in this field the classics, the classic tales. You know what I'm talking about, Ruby Creek, Albert Osman, the Ape Canyon incident. Jocko is one of the classics. Yale Town today has only about 80 people in it. In the 1880s, during and after the gold rush, there were about 15,000 people living there. And Yale Town in British Columbia, was a very bad place. If you recall that old HBO show, Deadwood, they could have called that show Yale Town and would have fit right in. Hardly a week went by without a gunfight, a knife stabbing, a robbery, a hanging, you name it. It was a wild west town. Now, they had what was considered a wonder of the world at the time, the old wagon road, which was the only way out of that area, the lower mainland of British Columbia, to get to places like Barkerville and Quinzel, up in the center of the province. When they built the Trans-Canada Railway, they built the part of it that went to Yale right on top of the old wagon road. Now, what happened in 1884, engineers coming south on that line approaching tunnel number four, saw a figure lying between the tracks and the cliff. And these old steam engines were very slow going uphill in those days, so they they hit the brakes and they blew the whistle, and whatever it was seemed to wake up. They described it as a creature about four feet, six inches tall, covered from head to foot in dark brown hair, and it immediately tried to cl- start climbing up the cliffside beside the track to get away from the men in the train. And the men all jumped out of the train and went and tried to capture it. The creature, or which was later named Jocko, got stuck on a ledge and couldn't do it. So the men actually managed to climb up and get above it. And being 1884 and people being what they were in those days, they started pelting it with rock. And they apparently hit him in the head with one, knocked him unconscious, and he fell to the ground off the cliff. They tied it up, put it in the baggage car, singled off brakes, and continued on their way through tunnel number four towards Yale. They telegraphed ahead that they had captured this thing, and it caused quite a stir of excitement, and half the town showed up at the, at the railway station to try and get a look at this animal. But we believe that the men who had captured it had taken it off at the edge of town on, at where the engine maintenance facilities were built in those days. There's no trace of them today. They're gone. The only thing we know is the town doctor, or Dr. Harriton, examined Jacko and described him as an ape-type creature and extremely strong longer arms than a man could break branches by just cracking them. Drank milk with with relish, ate all the green material they gave it, uh, solid material, vegetable material. They, they purposely, on the doctor's advice, withheld meat from him because they, th- they were afraid it might make him vicious. And this called quite a stir in Yale at the time. The men who had captured it named him Jacko, J-A-C-K-O. And their plan was, as was was revealed in the Victoria Times columnist, written about this capture. They were planning on taking him to Europe and putting him on display in a sort of carnival atmosphere. And that's where the history of Jacko ends, because there's no record of what happened to him after the men move the creature out of town. And you remember, this is 1884. The term Sasquatch had not even been coined yet. They had no idea with what they were dealing with. Most people just said things, oh, they just caught some crazy old Indian or something like that. No one knew. 
There are a lot of theories. Uh, a, a famous chief, Chief Ketsiano, claimed he saw Jocko being displayed in Vancouver, but I was never able to find any evidence of this in any of the Vancouver press at the time. you think there would be. So we don't know if that story is true. There's also the story that he was given to the nunnery in Bishop's Cove, and the nun shaved all his hair off and bathed them in scalding hot water, and he died. But there's no way to back it, find any backup for that story. The late Grover Krantz had a hypothesis that P.T. Barnum, you know that name. Yeah. Yeah, if there was one man in all of North America who would have paid a large number of money for the capture of something like this in 1884, it was P.T. Barnum. And just by coincidence, P.T. Barnum, later on that same year, 1884, did advertisement for a new display in the Museum of Natural Wonders called Jojo the Dog-Faced Boy. But there was never any photos or drawings published of Jojo. And for some reason, after about three weeks, all mention of Jojo disappeared from P.T. Barnum's advertisement. And... But Barnum was not a man to let a good name die. And we know he reintroduced the name five years later, Jojo the Dogface Boy, and people then saw photographs of a young man that was suffering from that rare affliction, I can't remember what it's called just offhand, where bo hair grows all over the body and stuff like that. And they had him dressed up in a Russian Cossack outfit with some big fiction story about how this was a tribe of hairy people in the Ural Mountains that fought the Tsar and fought for the Tsar, etc., etc., etc. But Grover had the theory, was what was the original Jojo the Dogfish Boy? Could that have been Jocko? And did he die and was buried somewhere? I don't personally uh, think that theory holds much weight because P.T. Barnum was the kind of man, he wouldn't care if he died, he'd stuff the body and put it on display anyway. So we don't know what happened to Jocko, but it, as I said in the forward I wrote for the book, it was a great opportunity to find an answer to a great mystery before the mystery became great. Unfortunately, because Jocko disappears from the history books, we don't know what happened to him, therefore it is now just looked at as what it is, a classic Sasquatch tale. Now, a lot of people had the theory because the Victoria Times colonists wrote this story that maybe it was a tabloid story. It was never true. Though we do have some old folks who were still alive when John Green started his research in the 50s remember all the excitement about Jacko. But the thing is, tabloid stories usually weren't shared from one paper to another. I myself found evidence in the archives in Calgary, Alberta, that the Winnipeg Free Press also published a story that same year about the capture of this creature in Jackal. So in my opinion, that throws out the tabloid story because they didn't share tabloid stories. And since then, some colleagues in the United States have found newspapers down there that published articles in 1884 about the capture of this creature up in British Columbia. So there's several stories talking about the, uh, the, the, the Jacko capture. So, like I said, it's a classic tale. I think it was probably true, but because he disappears from history and we don't know what happened to him, that's where it ends. Because in 1884, there was only two ways out of here. You had to go to Vancouver and leave by ship, or you had to go south of the border and take the American Transcontinental Railway, which was finished. The Canadian one was still a year away from being finished. It was still a big gap at Revelstoke. So the flash spike wasn't driven in for another year. The, the, that was the only two ways they could have gotten him out of here. He either went by ship or he went south of the border to the Americans. Now, if he went by ship and he died on ship somewhere, they probably would have just chucked the body over the side and never thought anything more of it. If he went to the United States and, and the late Grover Krantz's hypothesis of Jojo the Dogface Boy was right, then P.T. Barnum had him and he died and was probably buried. But again, I say P.T. Barnum probably would have displayed the body and stuffed it. But uh, that's the kind of guy he was. But again, it's a classic tale. Unfortunately, nothing more than that. And that's really too bad, because the area where Yale is, and I find Yale going from absolute, you know, gun-toting, saloon-type, brawling town to an absolute hippie convention is what it is now, Um 
and you have to drive through there in order to get to old Davy's home way up in the sticks. That area is very mountainous, very steep, with a real deadly part of the Fraser River in that Absolutely. area. Like the conditions Absolutely. for a Sasquatch in there, I've driven that canyon more so in the last year than I have my entire life. And I'll be honest with you, every time I go through the tunnels, every time I drive along that mountain, I'm thinking, how in the hell does Sasquatch live around here? Because that is one hell of a steep walk to get up to a cave or something along those lines. Oh, it is. It's beautiful country, and there's a long history of Sasquatch reports there. I have several files in and around Yale, Spuzzum, the Alexander Bridge, areas like that where there have been reports before that I've looked into. Sasquatch has a long history in that area, so the possibilities of one being there is not impossible at all. I would find it more believable today if it happened than I did in 1884, because there are barely 80 people who live in Yale now. In 1884, there was over 10,000. Yeah, it's crazy there. And like I said, it is now literally a hippie colony. When you drive through that town on a daily basis, they have all their tents set up with all their collectibles out for sale. And it's a re- it's turned into a really cool little town. Uh, oh, yeah. It- it's great. It's great. I was there today, or yesterday, as a matter of fact. I was there... Uh, I took uh, John Kirk and his fiance to tunnel number four to show him the spot where Yale was allegedly captured. It's about, about the eighth time I've been there. Until uh, myself and Bill Miller went there in uh, about ten, ten years ago, no researcher had ever bothered to look for it. But it's so, there. It's the description on, in the Victoria Times columnist to a T. I even think I know where the ledge was that he was trapped on. It just fits perfectly. Well, at that time, they were because there was no television, people were intent on painting a picture with words, so it wouldn't surprise me that it was that descriptive. Yes, yeah, and the fact that the doctor of the town, Dr. Harrington, examined the creature and said, I don't know what we've got here, but it's an ape type thing. Uh, and, of course, he had no idea what the Sasquatch was. Nobody did. The word hadn't even been coined yet. I'm not sure many people even heard the First Nations talk about it back then. They had no idea what they had. And like I said, it was a great opportunity to solve a great mystery before the mystery became great, and it didn't happen. Where on the highway would this be? If someone is traveling from Vancouver to the interior of British Columbia, where on the Trans-Canada Highway around Yale would this be? It's about two two miles north of Yale, about 100 feet down from the edge of the highway, which didn't exist in 1884. It wasn't there. The Trans-Canada Highway wasn't built until the early 1960s, remember, in the Fraser Valley. So the old railway, which was on top of the old wagon road, was the only road, the only way to get north of Yale in 1884, because Yale Town was the farthest the steam paddlers could go up the river before the current became too powerful for them to handle. That was the extreme limit of the old paddle wheeled steamboats that used to go up and down the Fraser River, Yale, which was, a, like I said, a bad place. There was a gunfight there almost on a weekly basis. There was a stabbing, murder. Half, half the buildings in town were saloons and brothels. It was a wild west town. And something like this probably caused a lot of excitement for about a week until the next shooting, <laughs> and then it was forgotten about. And you know what is intriguing about that is friends of ours uh, from Chronicles of the Unknown, they've been doing the Caribou Trail Gold Rush history tour that has, and they've been filming in different locations right up to uh, Barkerville to tell the story through the paranormal. And it's been very intriguing. But this is really where they started because everybody had to filter through Yale in order to get to New Westminster, which was BC's capital at that time, Victoria or Vancouver. Actually, at also going north, you, you took the paddle wheeler up to Yale, and then you got out, bought supplies, and you went on the old wagon road, which starts at Yale and went all the way up to Barkerville. 
it's really an insane piece of construction when you look well, at it. Much you know, uh, it's considered a wonder of the world. The, the Army Royal Marines uh, engineers had to uh, had to build it, and it took them years. And then when the CPR went through after the gold rush was over, they they literally commandeered it and put the track right down on top of the uh, of the uh, old wagon road so they wouldn't have to blast the new one. And that was the only way in by road, in or out, until the Trans Canada Highway was finally finished in I think 1960, 61. Yeah, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So in the end, what is your thoughts on Jacko? Good storytelling from a very rogue community in British Columbia, or do you think there was some actual merit to it? I think there's some actual merit to it. Unfortunately, there's no way to prove it, and it's simply one of the classic tales. But I I, I personally believe it was a true story. It's too bad. It's too bad because, I mean, that's the one story when you go back, Thomas, I'm sure you look at that story and you say, that was the one. That's the one that would have proven everything and we wouldn't be having these discussions today about it. Correct. Like I said in the Ford, I wrote the Ford for the book you're talking about. And I said, it was a great opportunity to solve a great mystery before the mystery became great. And it didn't happen. Very intriguing. How many sightings a year are you getting in British Columbia? Well, that varies quite a bit. Some years are busier than others. Uh, so far this year, I've looked into, uh, well, since New Year's Eve 2015, I've looked into four that I think may be authentic. And where are they happening in the area? All over. One was up uh, near Salmon Arm. Another one was just close to where I live in, at Weaver Creek. I've been there been there hey i have to get to a question this one comes from mike uh a good friend of mine he sent me it via text message have you ever investigated sightings north of the sasquatch inn where weaver creek is coincidentally in the 70s we had a friend who had a sighting at that lake there called echo lake have you ever investigated that I don't know the, which particular incident he's talking about, but I've investigated a large number of reports from the Sasquatch Inn all the way up to the north end of Harrison Lake. And literally, for, for people who it. don't... That's where most of my investigations have taken place, in and around the south end of Harrison Lake. And the best part is you don't have to go far. Like, you're nope. 60 kilometers from home, or 40 miles from home... And you're right in the wilderness where these yep. things are happening. I'm at the Sasquatch Inn uh, 50 minutes after I pull out of my driveway. That's a good pub, by the way, if you're ever touring that area. Go to the Sasquatch Inn. Check it out. Eat a Sasquatch burger, you won't eat again for three days. Ah. Not real Sasquatch meat. We do want to preface that. It's just no. the name. I, I'd be stealing it to get DNA analysis if that was the case. <laughs> What and we only got about four minutes left with you, Thomas. What for you makes a great sighting? The stories and sightings that intrigue me is the ones I can't find other explanations for. I'm a researcher. I'm trying to solve a mystery. Therefore, I look at all possibilities, the ones I can't solve, that keep me going. It's like I said, if I hadn't investigated that case in. 1986, where an American couple fishing saw a Sasquatch steal their fish on a, on a gill net, and I hadn't found all those footprints on the other side of the road by Bald Beard Creek where this thing apparently went. I found the tracks. The witnesses didn't even know they were there. If I hadn't found that in 1986, like I said, I may have given up on the Sasquatch and caved into my ex-wife's demands of giving up on the whole thing and concentrating on more important things. But I didn't. She's gone, and I'm still here. Okay, I have one final question for you in regards to Sasquatch hunting. Like me, there's a lot of amateurs out there who would like to to see a track. We're not. I'm not saying investigate Bigfoot, but if they're out in the wilderness, maybe trying to find a fishing hole, or maybe they're hunters, how do you look for a track besides just eyeballs down? 
Well, that's the only way you find tracks. You see them. Uh, I'd look in areas of creek beds, beach areas, any areas where the, where the ground is softer and muddy, where something large and heavy walking through will leave tracks. You'll find tracks all the time out in the wilderness areas of British Columbia. Bear tracks, cougar tracks, deer tracks, elk tracks, human tracks, boot prints. And every now and then you're lucky enough to come across a Sasquatch print. Those are the ones that will keep you fascinated. But you got to make sure uh, that it's not a beach area where some possibly some big guy with big ugly feet was walking around barefoot. <laughs> <laughs> True enough. But, yeah, you got to. But when you find one at the end of four service row where there's likely no one there and you find no evidence of uh, people and you find no boot prints or any other human prints around, you find a set of very, very large 17, 14 and a half, uh, 15 inch, what appear at first glance to be barefoot human prints but with certain differences and the variance in between the tracks, the odds are you have found a Sasquatch track, assuming the Sasquatch does exist. And we got just enough time, my friend, to tell everybody about the great books on Sasquatch that you've written. Okay. Uh, the first book I wrote was in 1989. It was called The Sasquatch in Alberta because for the first 24 years of my research, I was on the other side of the Rocky Mountains in Alberta. The second book I wrote was called Sasquatch Bigfoot, The Continuing Mystery. It was put up by Hancock House Publishers in 1993. Uh, one of my best ones was called In Search of Giants. That was also published by Hancock House Publishers in 2000. And since then, I've co-authored with other people two other books. One was called Beat the Sasquatch. That came out in 2004. And the latest one was called Sasquatch in British Columbia, which was a chronicle history of the, what we consider the most impre more impressive and important events in British Columbia from 1700 to 2012. The book was published in 2012, also by Hancock House Publishers. All these books, except for the Alberta book, were put up by Hancock House Publishers, and they are still available in stores that carry books on the Sasquatch question. The Alberta book has been out of print for decades. If you find one, hold on to it. And on that note, my friend, thank you so much for stepping up tonight and being on Spaced Out Radio. It's really good to have an opportunity to chat with you. And thanks once again, Thomas, for being a guest tonight. Good timing. You okay. I think, right. you're, I think your phone just died. I'm so, still here. Can you see? Barely. You're cutting out. You're cutting out. Uh-oh, my phone is dying. So I'll just say I enjoyed it. And uh, keep your camera handy, Dave. I will. Thank you, my friend. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Thomas Steenberg, our guest for the first two hours of Spaced Out Radio tonight. He is one of the top researchers in British Columbia when it comes to Bigfoot. Kind of confident in his words. Definitely not lacking there. But... He's good at what he does, and he's well-respected in the field. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We're going to be back with SOR Space Wires. Eric Markham joining me as we continue to talk Bigfoot in hour number three. We'll be right back. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Every month on Spaced Out Radio, we look into the deep and dark reports of cryptids roaming around the world with me, Rob Morphy, from Cryptopia.us. I would love it if you would join me and host Dave Scott as we delve into the most arcane stories and reports regarding creatures of the unknown. My job is to hunt down the details and bring the evidence forward to you. These aren't your regular Bigfoot stories I'm talking about either. You can find out more about crypto history at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? 
Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between. Hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Oh, there's only one way to rock. Loud and proud. In high definition, Radio 702 Rocks. Las Vegas. Find yourself constantly looking up in the sky, looking for answers? Have you had extraterrestrial contact? Are you an abductee? Looking for answers to your experiences? Hi there, I'm R. Keith Andrews, Spaced Out Radio's resident ET expert. Join me live the first Friday of every month where I take questions from the Spaced Out Radio chat room and help you understand those from the far off world. It's two hours of knowledge every experiencer should listen to. Hope to see you there. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with us on Spaced Out Radio? Head to spacedoutradio.com to check out the latest shows, guests, and sponsors. And don't forget to sign up for the Space Travelers Club. You'll find all you need at spacedoutradio.com. Welcome back for the final hour of Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, we round out the week. It's the first Friday of the month, which means... It's the ET experience with R. Keith Andrews, our resident ET expert. Tomorrow night we're going to get into everything alien. It's one of our highest rated shows that we do on a monthly basis. Keith really knows his stuff. It starts off at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. Then we give way on the weekend to Spaced Out Weekend with Elizabeth Anglin and James Tyson, who is celebrating a birthday today. I believe he is... Oh, goodness. 77, 78, maybe 80? I don't know. He's up there. But happy birthday to you, James Tyson. And today is also another big day in the Spaced Out Radio family. Corey Greaves, our booking coordinator, became a grandmother today for the first time. Little Melody was born this afternoon. Corey is extremely ecstatic and proud of her daughter and her fiancé for having this beautiful baby girl. And if you're Facebook friends with Corey, make sure you check it out. Wish her congratulations because she is very, very happy today. And who couldn't be? She became a grandma today. So congratulations to you and your family, Corey, from all of us at Spaced Out Radio. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, you can follow us at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. 
show at our website is spacedoutradio.com. While there, you can check out the SOR Space Wire with Eric Markham, who's going to join me momentarily for the final hour of this show. You can also... Check out our latest blogs. Eric has a new blog up there. Robert Rose does as well. Corrine, Elizabeth, and myself. My latest blog is on the ET landing, or the UFO landing that I saw in April of 2014. And while you're there, take the time to sign up for the SOR Space Travelers Club. For five bucks a month, what you can do is sign up. Your name gets automatically put into monthly prize draws. You get a private section for posting on our website. You're going to get access to private group interviews when we fire that up and so much more. The other shows, they want your money and they're only giving you access to their archives. Not us. We're giving back to you, the valued Spaced Out Radio listeners. So sign up today. We bring in Eric Markham tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He was with us last night with Dr. James Fetzer and he's been listening in to the Bigfoot Talk with Thomas Steenberg tonight. How are you, Eric? Doing fine. Glad to be here. Always a pleasure to have you on here, man. It really, really is, because I think you bring a level of science, you bring a level of understanding with your knowledge and your own research, so thank you for coming in for the final hour tonight. Oh, uh, thank you for having me. I really enjoy these nights. Oh, for sure. For sure. Now, We've been talking Bigfoot tonight, and Thomas has a very stern way of looking at Bigfoot. Maybe it's his military background. Maybe it's the fact that after 40 years of research and seeing what television has done to Bigfoot research, that's really, really made him a little bit more enclosed inside the community. Can you see where he's coming from on that with the way television, we've seen it happen in the paranormal where everybody now is a paranormal researcher and we're seeing it with Bigfoot due to the Sasquatch television shows that are on there. Do you see that happening as well? Yes, I do. I, I can understand. I see where he's coming from. I mean, you got never finding Bigfoot with their tease, their continual tease and, it's it's kind of shameful. I mean, they're not really doing anything other than wandering around out in the woods, pounding on trees, but then that's called Bigfoot research. You know, my idea of doing Bigfoot research would be get out there, get some backpacks and tents, get out there and just live off the land for a year where those things are supposed to be and see if you can encounter them. And then I'm not sure if I'd ever want to say, hey, you know, they really exist and they're here. I think it would just be my, for my own personal, it's like, yeah, cool. Like, you know they exist. You've seen them. Yes, I have. And I I just don't think it should ever come down to a bunch of idiots on TV exposing these creatures. And I hope it never happens. You know what? I I forgot. I have to mention tonight's SOR Space Traveler's Password by Bill Cardwell. Discernment is the password. So if you're a space traveler, discernment is what you go on the website. Post that in there. Some great things happen if you post tonight's password. (laughs) Thank you, Bill Cardwell, for doing so. The one thing I do like about Thomas, though, okay, for as rugged and as edgy as he is, he doesn't stray from what he is. And we've debated this the last few weeks on Spaced Out Radio. You wrote a blog on it. He calls himself a researcher. Not once did he use the word science tonight. I thought that was very profound because so many people are quick to throw the science word out there. And here's a guy who's been doing this for 40 years almost and not once did he refer to himself as a scientist or doing scientific research. He called himself specifically a Sasquatch researcher. What did you think about that? I thought that was very, yeah, I admired him for that. I really did. Because there's a big difference between being a scientist and being a researcher. And I also, he's going into it with a preconceived notion that this thing is Gigantopithecus. But he is holding himself to a very rigid standard of what he is considering proof. And I had to admire that because anybody that spent 37 years 
coming up dry for the most part, you would think that over time they would erode their levels. They'd say, well, what you find acceptable evidence might, you know, he might have lowered the bar, but it doesn't sound like he's lowered the bar. It sounds like every year he's been into it, he's actually raised the bar. And my hat's off to him for that. Yes, and you know what? There was no BS meter. He has a very short fuse with the BS meter. I think we can honest we could honestly say that we all got that point. But whether you call it Sasquatch, whether you call it Bigfoot, it, it really doesn't matter to me. He's a proud Canadian who served in the Canadian Armed Forces. Pardon me, the Royal Canadian Armed Forces. So you have to be able to give him his just desserts on being proud of where he's from and everything like that. Much like what we do when we see someone from when you're Canadian up here and you see someone waving the American flag a little bit too too much or too happily you know it's it's the same type of thing you know right. to me it doesn't really matter what side of the border you're on the fact is there's sasquatch in Canada namely in British Columbia there's sasquatch all over the western United States here as we call it Cascadia which includes British Columbia Washington state Oregon and of course, the northern ha- part of California. There's a lot of Bigfoot sightings in there. And I'm a firm believer that the creature is real. I'm a firm believer, as someone who has seen it, that this is something that is strange. He did bring up a point, because he challenged me tonight, Eric. He was, yeah. piss- he, was piss- <laughs> he was pissed off with me that, A, I didn't call him, and, B, that I didn't go back looking for footprints. The footprints one, I can see him kicking my ass on that one a little bit because I've even done that myself. Geez, why didn't you go back there, Dave? Maybe you could have found something. And that's exactly what I've thought. You know, but on the other part, uh, I just, you know what? When you have something that extraordinary, and we've talked about this many times on the air, I can honestly say this. The last thing on your mind is whipping out your your smartphone that has a camera on it and taking a photo. Maybe for the odd one person out of a hundred, they'll be able to think that way. But when your mind cannot process properly what your eyes are seeing, because you know that that creature isn't supposed to exist, it really plays with your head, Eric. I can imagine. I can imagine. It's, uh, but then again, okay, you go back, you find footprints. Dave, would a set of footprints have made validated any more? I mean, you saw this thing with your, you saw two of them with your, na- your naked eye. You saw them. Is there any doubt in your mind that you saw them? Would oh, the I know. footprints have made it any more real? And you know what? I've been questioned many a times, and I've got those looks, Eric, from people who just kind of snicker or whatever, you know, give you that, uh, you know, their BS meter is pulling up because they just can't fathom it. My father included. I yeah, remember, I get that with my dad. <laughs> you know, I remember that night I called up my dad, you know, because I had to tell someone. I was ec- ecstatic. I said, Dad, you're not going to believe what happened. He goes, what happened? And I said... I was in the forest tonight, and I saw two Bigfoot. And he goes, no, you didn't. And I'm, well, let's see, it happened in 2013. Uh, I'm 40 years old. I said, Dad, what do you mean it? I, I didn't? Why would I call you wasting my time telling you that I saw Bigfoot if I didn't see it? He goes, no, that's bullshit. That doesn't even exist. <laughs> Right, in, in typical five senses fashion. Yeah. Right. It's funny now though that my dad has been seeing what I've been doing with this show, he's more understanding. He's actually changed his tune. But for most people out there, they don't change their tune on that, Eric. Yeah, I know. My <clears throat> my dad's apparently well, my dad's the same generation as yours. We're probably within about ten you know, we're about ten years apart age wise. And they were the, if it's not in my lap, if I can't stick a fork in it, it's not real. My dad is slowly coming back. He doesn't necessarily believe or isn't willing to jump on the bad wagon, but he doesn't think I'm crazy either. When I told him about my ghost incident in Rhode Island, 
And, you know, he's had some semi-paranormal things happen to him, but he's just not willing to to believe that. But, you know, it's, it, it's, he could chalks it up to maybe it was a prescription he was on or, you know, he's not going to, He's not going to say he. He's not going to say he has any kind of belief in the paranormal. But he's getting more open to it. At least he doesn't think I'm crazy for believing in it. And my mom's always been a little bit hesitant to believe it, but she's seen and had some experiences in her own life that she's willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. Well, you know what, with my dad, a couple of years ago, or about a year and a half ago now, I was still in my old house, I sat him down and I told him all the experiences that I had had. And he sat back, you know, because he was the only one other than me that was allowed to sit in my recliner. And he, you know, because he kind of has that privilege, I mean, you know, and he sat back in my recliner and then he leaned forward and he said to me, he goes, son... I'm 64 years old at this time, or 66 years old at this time. And he goes, I'm 66 years old, and maybe I'm changing because I'm getting older, but who am I to say that you haven't seen what you've seen? He goes, goes, I believe you. And my jaw just dropped. I got a question from the beautiful Claudia Way in the SOR Space Travelers. Claudia always comes up with some of the most intelligent questions from our audience that we have. And this is for both of us. Okay. Her question is, would you tell Thomas Bigfoot talked to you in your window? I don't think so because I couldn't prove it. So would you share your stories with him? Because Thomas may lose opportunities by many because he is obviously so skeptic Many would not share their encounters. That may have slowed his ability to find Bigfoot. Eric, I'll let you answer that first. Well, yeah, I think if you've got a closed mind about it, you're not going to get... If you're not open to experience something, you're not going to experience it. Your your brain just isn't going to allow you... you The filters you have set up are going to block... What you're, you know, what's happening in front of you. I, I think he's hurting himself by having such a rigid view. I think if the guy opened up a little bit and was willing to, I think if he is willing to admit that yes, there might be language involved or not trammel himself, or maybe hobble himself with his strict belief that he might experience more. I'm not sure if that's answering her question or not. That's And you know what? I can see where a lot of people want to share with him their experience. And because he's more interested in the sighting of the creature rather than the details of what happened, whether it's wood knocking, whether it's a howling. Because when I told him about the roar, he immediately said he wasn't interested in that. He wanted to know exactly. about the sightings. And you know what? I, I give him credit on this point, okay, that he has his focus and determination so tunnel visioned that he isn't straying off that. He doesn't want to hear about the other parts, okay? What he wants is he wants, okay, when was your sighting? What did you see? He vets the person, much like he vetted me on the air with my experience, okay? And then what he does is he says, why didn't you call me? Because he wants to get out there ASAP to get the investigation going. Because you know, the longer it takes to get to an investigative site, the less chance there's going to be material there to actually investigate or clues. And, you know, let's face it, places get contaminated by other animals, by weather, by absolutely everything that happens in nature. So you can't blame him on that. But... As a Sasquatch researcher, I think you have to be able to keep everything plausible. Because when you're dealing with the unknown, you really really have to 
keep an open mind on that. I don't think you can go into these subjects close-minded. You know, but he's been doing it for 40 years. He has had a lot of research and people and quality sightings. He wants quality. He doesn't want quantity. And I think that's probably the best way to put it. That is admirable, but he is missing. Uh, like like Claudia is saying, would you actually walk up, if even if you had the film footage to back you up, I get the impression that wouldn't be good enough for him. You could have clear, unshaky film. I heard a lot of his, his what wasn't acceptable evidence, but I didn't really get what he thought other than if one picked him up and tossed him in a tr- in a tree, what he would consider legitimate evidence. Well, and I don't think if you had a story, even if you knew it was uh, like your like your encounter, it's well, you're just another guy that says he saw a Sasquatch. You're just another person that says talk to you through the window. There's no breaking down that barrier for him. I don't know what it would take. Other than one walking up and actually saying, hey, hi, I'm Sasquatch. Here you've been looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe send him a text message. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know what his, what his acceptable evidence would be. And, and that's he, not a critique. I just, he, probably has this, he probably has this idea in his head what he would accept. And after this long, he doesn't, he doesn't put it out there because to him it's a given. So I'm not sure. I don't think I would come forward and tell him anything because, like I said, without, I I don't know what he would even consider, uh, you know, justifiable evidence. On the flip side, though, as he did state earlier on in the show, he did say that because of what has happened with the media boom in regards to Bigfoot on both sides of the border, Okay, he focused more on the U.S., but I'm going to tell you right now, it's happening up here as well. Okay, that's naive to say that it doesn't, because the one thing Canada is very good at doing is following Big Brother down south. And when you have people running through the bushes, okay, trying to gain evidence, squatch this, squatch that, okay, and kind of seeing television make a mockery of the great research that a lot of scientists over the decades have taken a lot of heat over. I can see where he is a little bit bitter because of that, because we want to illuminate everything. We want to make it almost like a religion for a lot of people. All he wants is the down and dirty. And I'm, and I'm not trying to defend Thomas on this because I agree with you, Eric, that he really needs... That was your chair and not something else, right? Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Are you sure? Because we don't want you breaking wind on the air here, bud. No, 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 that was my chair. Okay. <laughs> I just shifted in my chair. <laughs> All right. I wouldn't keep it. it was the other. <laughs> just making sure. Oh. You know. Yeah, it's a vinyl. It's a vinyl. And if... You scoot on it, it makes flatulent sounds. Exactly. But you know what? Like I'm saying, I mean, this goes back to the the stupid saying that I came up with, which is the Caucasian Christian scientist. You know what I'm saying? Where right. if, if it comes from First Nations, if it comes from eyewitnesses, Basically, what he's saying is eyewitness ter- testimony re- means nothing. First Nations history and legends really don't mean as much as they probably should. It is a little closed minded. I do agree with you there. And like I said, when you're dealing with a creature that nobody has any knowing of, because we really don't, to close doors before they've opened, just because it may sound ludicrous or it may sound off the charts. I think is doing more research a disservice than it is a service. But on the flip side, to play devil's advocate and see Thomas's side, the television explosion of Bigfoot shows, from hunting Bigfoot to finding Bigfoot, sure, they're there for entertainment. A lot of people like those shows. I can tell you right now, I have watched a grand total of 17 minutes of one show. I I just shook my head 
and I'm not even a Bigfoot researcher. I'm just someone who's seen it. But I just shook my head, knowing how television and the media works, saying they're going to fool a lot of people. And that's television's job. It's manipul- manipulation on that. Right. Right? I just, yeah, I agree. And, and they, you know, they, don't, they have no more, I don't think they have any more belief in it than you know, anybody else. It's just, hey, this is our gig. Let's throw around some pseudoscientific sounding words and let's get us a, make us a team of a believer, an experiencer, and a skeptical scientist. And basically, I don't know what that, and the, the one of them, if she's a, if she's a biologist, I'm a can-can dancer. You'd look good in the skirt. Well, thank you. the The beard yeah. may the beard may have to go, but you uh, look good in the skirt. No, I'd just braid it. <laughs> well, speak, speaking of braiding, okay, we have three people in three different areas, very stretched out apart, who all have horses, who have all had their horses braids or manes braided. Elizabeth Anglin, who's on Cosmic Passport in Colorado, her horse had their his mane braided. In Joe, in California Nevada border, he has had his horse's braids made, or mane braided. Sorry, and Bill Cardwell, who sets the SOR Space Travelers password every night, discernment tonight. Thank you, Bill. He's had the same thing. Now, Bill lives in Ontario, Canada, where from where I am is about 3,000 miles away. It's also about, three, about let's say, 2,500 miles away from Colorado, where Elizabeth was. Colorado, if I do my mathematics correctly, from California, where Joe is, is probably 1,000 to 1,500 miles, which makes... Bill to Joe, 3,000 miles away. Three different people, three people who don't know each other on a personal level, all three having the same experience. And we have heard researchers on this show, and the guy I like to refer to, I think is the best of them all, Mike Johnson, out of Sasquatch, or out of SIR, out of Colorado, in the Rockies there. And... I think he's nailed it bang on with that this is a gentle creature that cares for other animals that really doesn't want to be disturbed and doesn't trust anything else. And he has actually researched braided manes on horses because there's something about the braided mane. So on that note, Eric, I'm going to get you to hold on. Right. We, are, we are going to go to a break here. At the bottom of the hour, we have half an hour to go. Eric, I almost called you Coop there, all because all because all because Claudia there in in Facebook land put Eric Cooper instead of Eric Markham. You know, yeah, Coop's pretty awesome. We got to give him a hard time for breaking up Coop Squared tonight. That's what we have to do. You know, I'm I'm sure we'll hear it because I know he's listening. He's just pretty tired. He's been working a, a really hard case today and the past few days. So the poor guy's beat up a little physically right now. But we're going to take a break here. We're going to have more Sasquatch talk, more talk about anything with Eric Markham from the SOR Space Wire right after this. Are you an experiencer? Have you had run-ins with strange creatures you can't explain? ETs, Dogman, Bigfoot, Werewolves? They're enough to scare the daylights out of anyone. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski from your four cop. And on the last Monday of every month, you can listen to me and the host, Dave Scott, talk about the weird and the strange being reported on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going to bring my investigations and sources, you bring your experiences, and we'll figure out the rest together. Strange Days on Spaced Out Radio. Come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us. From the radio, commercials, to banners, to social media. Have a product you'd like our host to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spaceoutradio.com for more details. Visit purpleplates.com today. 
For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Right here, this is where we divulge the fruit of our research. Here on the Webster Phenomena every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern on Space Out Radio. Attention Spaced Out Radio listeners, for only $5 a month, you can join Spaced Out Radio Space Travelers. Your membership at spacedoutradio.com will give you access to private fan area on the website, get you a monthly newsletter, draws for monthly swag, and a whole lot more. Sign up today to become a part of the Spaced Out Radio experience. Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you'd join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. We'll give you some equipment updates and some of our experiences on the road. Right here on Spaced Out Radio. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. Missed most of tonight's show? Don't worry, you didn't miss a thing. You can head to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and download our archives for free. And don't forget to get your Space Travelers membership today. Now, back to tonight's show. Welcome back to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the show, we're back into ET Talk. It's the first Friday of August, which means our Keith Andrews will be back for the ET Experience That's tomorrow night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time at spacedoutradio.com. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. While you're on our website... Sign up for the SOR Space Travelers Club. It's only 5 bucks a month. You can also check out some very talented writers, including yours truly in our blog section. My latest blog is about a UFO landing that I witnessed in April of 2014. You can also check out the SOR Space Wire by our news director, Eric Markham, who is with me right now on the air. And if you like our music... Check out Bumblefoot, Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses. He does all our music here on a nightly basis for Space Out Radio. Eric Markham is back with us. We're talking Bigfoot. How are you? Doing fine. Thank you. Tanya has a question in the SMR Space Travelers Club. She's a newbie to the group. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. And I have heard this before as well. I don't buy it, but I'm going to ask the question. She's saying, I have heard something very disturbing about why Bigfoot braids horses' hair in a Bigfoot podcast. This person said that the reason Bigfoot does that is because they have 
sexual relations with the horses. Apparently, he has had witnesses to this, like farmers seen it happening. Like I've said, I've only seen this once or heard this once, so I'm wondering if anyone has heard this before. I have heard this as well. I don't buy it for a second. The theory behind that is there are actually two Sasquatch. There is the male Sasquatch, which is performing the relations, while another Sasquatch does the braiding to ease the tension in the horse. I do not buy this for a second. And the one thing that I will say is this. It gets a little bit... It's questions and topics like that And I'm not blaming you, Tanya, for bringing it up because I have heard this story before a couple of times. I have one guy from a group that used to follow us who would ask that every time I had a Bigfoot person on, he wanted me to ask that question about horse rape, to put it bluntly. And I just stopped asking the question after I think twice because it just kept coming up and kept coming up and... I think for a lot of researchers out there who are going through that and hearing that question, I think what it does is it it's always one of those, well, a friend of a friend of a friend. Urban myth. <laughs> yeah, told me that. And I really believe that when you start getting into stuff like that, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But there's so many different avenues that we can take with it that until that's one that i will say unless i see it on video i'm not buying that one whatsoever right it's gonna have to be a very good video (laughs) yeah i'm i'm of the mind that i I, i'm not a horse person but i've been around them and i think that's the idea of taking a horse unwillingly i don't think a horse is going to stand for that I mean, they get creepy if you just walk around them the wrong way. I can't Im- imagine trying to rape a horse, even as strong and big as Bigfoot is supposed to be. I don't think that that horse is going to just sit there and let it happen docilely because somebody's braiding its mane. That just doesn't, to me, it just doesn't ring true. Well, Bill Cardwell makes a comment here he says my horse wouldn't allow such behavior she is a big belgian quarter horse cross and knows how to kick hard yeah you know so i'm pretty sure unless that sasquatch is playing a little berry white on the stereo (laughs) to get the horse in the mood i really don't see that happening and you call i hate to say this call me skeptical but there are certain things where i think people in this field take it a little bit too far okay and i think this is one of them well one of the things that i want to mention braiding the hair if okay let me back up a second i've I've got ahead of myself many of the first nations talk about having traded with Bigfoot with making baskets. That Bigfoot doesn't know how to make baskets. Braiding hair is so related and so close. It almost makes me wonder, if, okay, if something can't make a basket, can it braid? You know, is, is Bigfoot actually capable of braiding hair? I don't know. That's just something that popped into my head as we were talking about it. But don't forget, a lot of the very big Bigfoot researchers out there, the big name ones, and we've had them on this show, will tell you that it has been seen, it has been done, and I trust people like Mike Johnson. I, To me, out of every Bigfoot guest that we've had on, not to put other people down or other researchers down, including Thomas Steenberg tonight... I think Mike Johnson has probably the best recollection and relationship with the beings that he is trying to prove the existence of. And and when you re- remain open-minded to the idea 
and you start learning the stories around there, I think it would it would be very, very possible. And Joe brings up a good point in the SOR Space Travelers. I can braid hair, but I doubt I can make a basket. And I'm I'm pretty much the same way. I mean, I have two daughters, man. I used to I used to braid hair all the time because that's what good dads do. So I could see where the braiding would come into would come into play. And I don't see strangers running into a barn at night to go braid a horse's mane and then leave without any notion of anything else. I just don't see that. Hmm. I I guess because I can do both. And I don't mean I'm like an expert basket weaver, but I've done it, you know, Boy Scouts, whatever. And I guess I just made the connection that one's an awful lot like the other. But then again, we don't really know that Bigfoot doesn't make its own bat. You know, that's sort of a community building type. Of, uh, you know, who's to say they're not smart enough to have gotten one, seen the Indians do it, got one from them and say, hey, we can do this ourselves. Or we're talking about two different, uh, I've often wondered, okay, with the UFO the, the connection with Bigfoot, are we looking at maybe a race that has divided somehow? Like maybe there's a spacefaring version or a version that is connected with a spacefaring race because you have the, the UFO Bigfoot connection, but then you have... Like maybe their ancestors that were left on Earth that have had a parallel evolution and haven't gone into the technology, and we're seeing interactions between both. Could be, could be. There's been a lot of people who have uh, been taken on spaceships who have said that they have heard or seen Bigfoot on spaceships. Right. There's also a group out there who believes Sasquatch was dropped off here. From another planet. There's a lot of different theories out there. I, I tend to believe that over Bigfoot raping horses. Yes. I, yeah, okay. I don't, like, I don't like, go that one. <laughs> Bill Cardwell makes another good comment here. He says, My horse defends herself against bears and wolves just fine. A rapist Bigfoot wouldn't stand a chance. I, I agree. And something that, okay, unless these these Sasquatch have medicine. And I'm sort of of the impression they're, if they're injured, it's not like they have a Bigfoot hospital they can go to. If they are injured, they just have to deal with it like a primitive human would have to do. I don't think just evolutionary, evolutionarily, you're going to put yourself in harm's way if you don't have a way to cure or deal with the consequences a broken leg to something that lives out in the wild like that if they don't have a concept of medicine or they don't have a, a way of setting bones that's a death sentence so i don't think they're going to engage in a i just i think their own instincts would keep them from engaging in any kind of behavior that would cause a serious injury and i think raping a horse would probably fall into that category one good kick, and you've got broken ribs, or you've got a pneumothorax, you've got a broken leg, broken pelvis. You're not going to bounce back from that. Claudia has a question for you, Eric. Okay. Do you believe synchronicities are orchestrated by what we believe in? For instance, in the paranormal, it seems to happen in... It seems to happen this way. Since we are open-minded, it's like our spirit connects with another spirit, living or non-living. And then that spirit is drawn to us to be seen. I kind of, yeah, I kind of like that. I, I don't think synchronicity, I think synchronicities are out there just like radio waves. You know, right now we're sitting here and there's radio broadcast waves beaming through us. And we're not tuned to pick them up. I think the synchronicities are out there, but you have to be able, to, you have to set your tuner to pick them up. So yeah, I guess I believe I believe that you have to be open 
for the synchronicities to happen. I hope that answers your question, Claudia. I hope so, because I, I think the synchronicities are along the same lines as well as what you said. I, I think that the minute we open ourselves up, it's like opening up a gateway to never, never land in Peter Pan type thing. I know that's right. a hor- I know that's a horrid example. If anybody's listening to this, they'll probably be like, are you serious? That guy just said that. Mm-hmm. What is, what does he really know? But on the flip side, on the flip side, I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that from my own personal experience, which started off very paranormally, I've watched things open up and gateways open up in my own personal experiences that have flowed into other areas as well. So I do think that the possibility that those synchronicities do run together are very, very strong. Maybe the, maybe there is a, a organizing or some kind of consciousness that, you know, if you want to call it God, if you want to just call it a collective conscious that isn't going to waste time sending experiences to somebody who isn't, isn't uh, open to them. It's sort of like giving flowers to somebody who hates your guts. Yeah, you know, why would you bother? So there, you know, I'm not, I'm not a practicing Catholic Christian, but I do have a very strong feeling that there is a deity of some kind out there. I don't think Earth relig- our religions really have a handle on it, but I do believe there's a God, and I think maybe He sends things, or the, the it, whatever. I'll just say He for lack of a better term, but God sends things to people who are open to accept them. And sure. if you're not open to it, you're you know, why waste the you know, why waste it? It'd be like sending a calling somebody whose line is disconnected. It's, you know, it's kind of pointless. And once you know, I look at me, I went from being a dude locked in a laboratory to working on this radio show with you in a matter of months, because I was open to the experience, it happened. So, yeah, in my own life, I can see that having opened myself to possibilities has allowed possibilities to happen. Claudia then is followed up. Seems everything has a spirit. A spirit is part of them, and each spirit is able to be able to receive the wave of contact. The spirit receives the wave. She is so in-depth. This, yeah. is, this is why I, I love having her as part of the SOR Space Travelers because she is just so in depth, way more in tune than I could ever be. Hey, we only have about 12 minutes left here, if that. Wow. Yeah, I know. it's uh, It's gone very, very quickly. Last night, James Fetzer was with us. You hosted with me. And after the show... I have to tell this. I had, you were on the phone with me because we were talking after the show. And I had an absolute amazing UFO sighting last night. First one I have had in literally months. And what are you snapping at there? Excuse me? Are you snapping your fingers? No, no. No. S- sounded like it. Wow, this microphone must be sensitive as heck. Totally sensitive. At least you're not farting again. That, <laughs> I didn't you know. fart last time. You know. <laughs> Anyways, I want to get to my UFO sighting. <laughs> okay. It's uh, Last night, I'm on the phone with Eric, talking about the show with James Fetzer, which was an incredible show. And... All of a sudden, I see in the north, i got to think my direction here, in the northeastern sky, I see a light flash. Now, going back to the day when I had the UFO landing on the ground, and if you read my blog at spacedoutradio.com, you can read all about that story. 
the third time that ship land when it was on the ground the third time it turned its lights off and on it started strobing on the ground much like what i've seen in the sky and this one started strobing and i said hey i think i see a ufo let's see if i can make it strobe again so i said can you turn strobe me again and the light went off and it was still in the same spot and i said thank you i th- said can you strobe again please the light went on and then off and that happened what about 15 times eric yeah exactly yeah, i think it was 15 before it took off yeah you know and, and I was just sitting there like, it's overcast, it's cloudy, it's raining where I'm at. It's like, dang it. <laughs> I would have loved to jump out to see if it was high enough, maybe I could have seen it too. I don't know. I was, I was very envious of what was going on. Well, you know what? So was I. So was I. You know, because I didn't have you here with me to, to actually watch it. And it was really shitty that you couldn't you know you know that you had to watch it over the phone because even if i had facetimed you or or put put you on you know my camera it, you wouldn't have seen anything anyways right but that that was very i was so glad for you because i know we've talked about this on other shows where you had got you it broke your dry spell there'd been a drought of there UFO. was a drought you yeah. know several well, several months had gone by hadn't it I think you said several months had gone by since you've had any. About 11 months. Wow. 11 months. And you know what the one thing that I, that I said, and the audience is going to think that I'm, you know, BSing here. You were on the phone with me. You know, my reaction, you know, I'm not a BSer. Right. Okay. When I asked that, because that light was stagnant. At first, it was stagnant in the sky. And I asked it to move on over my house. And when that strobing all of a sudden was right over top of my house and then slowly continued away, the light started off, just so you know, the light started off white. On the third or fourth strobe, it turned to red. By the time it got over my house, it was an orangish white in that 15, 16 times that it strobed on its path. But I'm still amazed that here I, here I'm saying to you, like I'm freaking out saying this, this light, it's heading towards my house. It's heading towards my house. Now it was way up there in the sky. It was way up there. Like we're talking satellite area, but you have to remember satellites don't have lights. They don't have lights on them. And when you see something strobing, like I have seen it on the ground, I know the difference between what is an airplane, what isn't. We're lucky to have maybe two flights, three at the maximum, fly over my area because I'm in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, you're not really on any kind of flight path. No, no. The only flight path I'm on is an international flight heading towards Calgary or most likely Toronto. Because the Vancouver flight path is about four hours south of me if you're driving. Four and a half hours south of me if you're driving. So I am, I was blown away by that last night. Claudia has a question for you, the lovely Claudia. She apparently loves the compliments. Thank you, Claudia. (laughs) Claudia is asking you, Eric, what type of ships have you seen? Uh, nothing of a shape. Uh, the last one I saw was, uh, it actually happened last time we talked up at my mom, when I was up at mom and dad's up in the mountains of North Carolina, I saw a white, whitish blue, uh, it was so far up there was like a point of light, like you would see if a satellite was going by, but instead of being on that kind of trajectory, it went from one place. I looked up and saw it go from one place to another, almost like it was waiting for me to look up. 
but it was just a pinprick, you know, just a pinprick of light. It traveled, I don't know how to judge distance in space, or, you know, up, but it traveled, if you, you hold your hand up full length, it would have spanned, like, if your hand, my hand is spread out about, so, looked like what it would have been about relative four or five inches. It moved in a streak, just not, not a streak like a meteor. It just went from this point to that point very rapidly, stopped, and then vanished. And the one I saw back in the 70s was way up there. It was a, and this was a daylight, you know, dusk, daylight uh, uh, sighting. All three of my mom, my dad, and I all saw it. And it's the same as when uh, light reflects off an aluminum aircraft. It was just a real bright, looked like a reflected sunlight. And it moved. Here again, it was just like an orb. Or, there was no surface detail. I couldn't say it was saucer shape, cigar shape, what. It was far enough up. But the movements it was making, it would start from one point, move over. Then it would come back to the point it started at. And then it... It would just move around, and it was obviously moving far enough that it wasn't what they call autokinesis, where you stare at something that moves, your mind makes it move. This thing was actually moving, and and it was, you know, that's the two I've seen. The ones in my dreams are a little different, and I don't really want to go there because that's my, I have a feeling that that recurring dream isn't so much a prophecy thing, it's just... I'm so into the sci-fi and involved with everything. I just think it's my brain entertaining itself when I'm asleep. <laughs> For sure. And you know what? We're going to get into more ET talk tomorrow night with our Keith Andrews, who is always one of our more popular and controversial shows out there in regards to it. So, Bigfoot, you a believer or not? Yes, I am a believer. I'm not sure what it is, but I don't think you can discount. I just don't, I, you can't, to me, you can't take all the oral traditions of the Native Americans, the First Nations people, and just poo poo it. I mean, there's obviously some of their tales that are myths or legends, but there's too much about the hairy man. And it goes back into some of their religions. So the only reason we're, well, they have these two archetypes, you know, Coyote and Hairy Man. Coyote wanted us to walk on all fours, and it was, you know, Hairy Man that won out and we walk upright. There's too many diverse cultures who have a tradition of this creature. And then we've found, you know, fossil evidence of. The little, the little foot, the a, oh, the name of it escapes me, but they call it the Hobbit. They call it Hobbit. It was a forens, some some kind of early, you know, midgety looking know, human ancestor that actually coexisted at one time. They haven't gone extinct that long ago. I just think there's too much. There's too much evidence pointing toward. Big, you know, Sasquatch, even uh, early Spanish conquistadors that were trooping up and down the coast of California wrote about encounters with a large, hairy man shaped. And it wasn't a grizzly bear. A lot of skeptics or debunkers will say, well, they're just talking about grizzly bears. No, because they also log their experiences with grizzly bears. It's separate animals. So I think there's enough. I think there's enough anecdotal evidence out there to point to this really being a real creature. And on that note, my friend, it's time for us to call it a night. All righty. Thanks for hopping in on that final hour. Hey, thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. Eric Markham from the SOR Space Wire. Earlier on, the first two hours, we had Thomas Steenberg, Bigfoot researcher right here in the province of British Columbia. ThomasSteenberg.com is his website. We got our man Bumblefoot rocking us out. He rocks us in, rocks us out. Bumblefoot.com is his website, or go to their Spaced Out Radio website, spacedoutradio.com. Click on the Bumblefoot banner. 
and check out all about the Guitar God. Remember, while on our website, you can read up on our blogs, check out the SOR Space Wire, our news section, see who we affiliate with, and while you're there, spend the five bucks a month, join up with the SOR Space Travelers. It'll be worth your while. I want you to win a prize. Tell a friend if you love this show. That's how we're going to grow this ever-expanding audience, and we get newbies every day in here. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to take your time, your precious time, and spend it with us. Tomorrow night on the show, our Keith Andrews is back with us. The ET Experience with Mr. Keith. He does it the first Friday of every month, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time, before we give way to Spaced Out Weekend, Saturday and Sunday night. We will talk to you in exactly 21 hours. I'm your host, Dave Scott. Good night. Mr. Bumblefoot's taking us home. Stay in line, don't make a mistake We're watching We watched you fall